This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 271 of the program. Today is Friday, December 18th, and believe it or not, this is the very last episode of 2020. So we say goodbye to 2020, and uh, my sentiment on that is good riddance, because this year has been incredibly, incredibly difficult. So of course, since this is the last episode of the year, I have quite a bit planned But before we get to that, of course, I want to take some time to thank all of the people who make the show possible. All of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us. And that includes Big Daddy 2, Coralie LaSalle, Daniel Ruiz, Daniel Scheinhaus, Ida Webbs, Janice Carlson, and Jennifer Martin. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you would also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this is one of those episodes where we are going to go well beyond three hours. You know, we're just, we're going to have a lot of fun. And also we'll talk about the serious political issues, but we're going to make sure that you have enough content to get you to January 1st. So on this gigantic episode, we will talk about Jimmy Dore's pressure on AOC to force a floor vote on Medicare for All. Also, Tulsi Gabbard goes full mask off in her remaining weeks in Congress. We'll talk about that. Also, an Iowa State Democratic Party audit blames the DNC for the Iowa caucus debacle. Trump's delusions continue unsurprisingly, and at this point, I mean, it's just getting sad. And while we're on the subject of Donald Trump, we will discuss how he will remain influential in the Republican Party, probably for quite some time. Also, Ivanka Trump may mount a primary challenge against Marco Rubio. We'll talk about the implications of that. And an FCC commissioner wants the Senate GOP to obstruct Biden in order to preserve Ajit Pai's legacy of trying to ruin the internet. Scientists are warning of societal collapse due to climate change in an ominous open letter to world leaders. And finally, we will close the show with our annual 2020 awards where we will decide what the most badass and W moments of 2020 are and we will also crown our scumbag and mvp of 2020 and finally we'll close the show with an emotional recap of 2020 which again was just such a difficult year for all of humanity that's what we've got on the agenda uh let's waste no time this is already a long enough episode so i'm not i'm not gonna ramble let's get right to it So I feel like I'm beating a dead horse with this story, Uh, but basically, as you all know, Donald Trump's last Hail Mary was this weird lawsuit from Texas where basically Texas alleges that other states violated their own state constitution by offering mail-in voting to their residents in the middle of a pandemic. I'm oversimplifying it, but that's basically it. I mean, the case was bogus. They didn't have standing. It wasn't going to go anywhere. And predictably, it failed. And the Supreme Court directly shot Donald Trump down. So if you're Donald Trump and you are going to maintain that you didn't actually lose and the election was stolen from you, now is the time where when you have nowhere left to go, you start changing what you say. You know, look, I think we won this election, but the fight's over from now. Now we focus on 2024 or something. Uh, So what is he doing? How is he changing his rhetoric with regard to this election fraud scheme? Well, he's not. He's not changing anything. Even after the Supreme Court shot him down, he's saying the same exact things. Uh, These are just some of the tweets that he put out. Uh, We have just begun the fight. He tweeted this after the Supreme Court shot him down. Uh, The Supreme Court really let us down. No wisdom, no courage. I won the election in a landslide, but remember, I only think in terms of legal votes. Oh, okay. Not all of the fake voters and fraud that miraculously floated in from everywhere. What a disgrace. Who is a worse governor, Brian Kemp of Georgia or Doug Ducey of Arizona? These are two rhino Republicans who fought against me and the Republican Party harder than any Democrat. They allowed states that I won easily to be stolen. Never forget... 
vote them out of office. And then he says, uh, most corrupt election in U.S. history. He's literally going to continue saying the same thing. And by the time you watch this video, the Electoral College will have already confirmed Joe Biden's victory, but he's still going to keep saying the same thing. Oh, don't you worry. We're still fighting. We're just getting started. We're going to win this. There's like another lawsuit up our sleeve or something. Look, if you are actually going to run for president in 2024, you could start talking about that now so you don't look as delusional, but he's not changing anything. And in an interview with Brian Kilmeade of Fox News, which is extremely entertaining to watch, he says the most ironic thing I've ever heard him say. You, uh, when you look at this fight, though, you have 77% of Trump supporters who believe you won the election, according to a, yeah. a Fox poll. I've heard, I've heard there's, actually there's much a, higher numbers there's than a, that. There's a rally right now in Washington for that. Do you worry about the country being divided as if it goes to inauguration and they still feel that way and you still feel that way? No, I worry about the country having an illegitimate president. That's what I worry about. A president that lost and lost badly. This wasn't like a close election. Uh, you look at Georgia. We won Georgia big. We won Pennsylvania big. Uh, we won Wisconsin big. We won it big. But your guys we won all of these states. But do you think your legal team has proven that? Well, we don't. We never get a chance to prove it because a judge will say, "Well, I'm sorry, you don't have standing." Like, how about me? Texas and all of these states, uh, 18 or 19 altogether, they come in. Think how nice that is. Where they actually come in, and they say, "We want to support you, sir, because you're important to this country. We want to support you." They go in and they say, "The states don't have standing, and I don't have. I'm president of the United States. I just got 75 million votes." the biggest number of votes in the history of our country ever gotten by a sitting president. It's funny how his vote totals are accurate, but since Joe Biden got more votes than him, it can't possibly be accurate. So if, if the same systems, uh, if you use AP or Decision Desk, if they are accurately reporting your vote totals, why wouldn't you also believe that they're accurately reporting Joe Biden's vote totals? Oh, well, there's an easy answer for that, Mike. It's because they're reporting the illegal votes, too. But look at what he said. I worry about the people having an illegitimate president. Uh, that's what I worry about. A president that lost and lost badly. This wasn't like a close election. The irony just flew right over his head because if he were successful at getting Republicans from various states to appoint their own electors that would vote for him, then you're basically disenfranchising millions of people and killing democracy, quite literally. But that's what he wanted. But yet he's worried about the people having an illegitimate president and a president that lost badly. You lost badly. You lost multiple states. So if this effort were even to be successful, you know, he would have a better case, even though he wouldn't have a case at all, but you'd have a better argument if it came down to like one state, like in the 2000 election. There was one state, Florida, and that's all that Bush had to focus on. But you have multiple states. So the fact that it's not even that close in actuality and he's still maintaining that he won, it just, it's embarrassing. And I don't necessarily care what Donald Trump says. I care about the consequences of his words, right? Because he has convinced a lot of Republicans that he actually won this election, which is shocking because of course he didn't. If the establishment was going to rig any election, wouldn't it have been back in 2016 to stop you from becoming president in the first place? I mean, all you have to do is think about these allegations of fraud for a minute or two, and you realize that on their face, they're absolutely ridiculous. He also says, you look at Georgia. We won Georgia big. We won Pennsylvania big. We won Wisconsin big. No, you did not. You literally did not win these states. And by saying this, he knows it's not true, but he's trying to get people to think that he's true. And part of this, and I don't know if Trump is even this savvy and really playing four-dimensional chess to this extent, but I, I think that if he actually does run in 2024, he's setting himself up now to clear the field in the Republican primary and say, look, I'm the rightful president. I should be president right now, but this election was stolen from me. So anyone who's running against me, they're complicit in the Democratic Party's fraud. I mean, maybe that's what he's doing, but I just want to ask, at what point does his family step in? They know that what he's doing is delusional. Like, part of me thinks that Donald Trump really believes that he won. Maybe it's cognitive dissonance. But another part of this, like, you see what he's saying. This is not a well man. Regardless if this is all, you know, him playing politics and political theater, what he's doing is harmful. So after the election, there were reports that Don Jr. or maybe Ivanka would step in and stage an intervention and get him to accept the results. What happened to that? I mean, this is cruel. 
You see someone in your family, regardless if he's the president or not, clearly unwell, saying things that make him seem delusional. At what point does the family get blame? And I think we're beyond that. Why isn't Ivanka, the person who's basically the only one who's seemingly able to talk sense into him, not saying, Dad, it's over. I know that you think that you won this election, but you're not going to be the president. Come January 21st of 2021, you're out. So now it's time to think about what you're going to do on that day. But I mean, we get we get nothing. Like if a member of my family was spiraling publicly like this, I would be embarrassed for them. And out of love, I would try to rein them in, right? Talk some sense into them. But we're not getting that. Now Trump's family, I, I think they're intimidated by him and they don't want to confront him. They're just letting him like spew this bullshit when they know it's not true. You know, as entertaining as it is, this really is going to do long-term da long damage to our democracy. It is. Because if Americans don't believe that the process is legitimate and credible, then that's when you start seeing democracy fall apart. And there are legitimate reasons why you can be dissatisfied with our democracy. I don't like our electoral institutions. I think they're biased against third and fourth parties. I think that, you know, winner-take-all systems are just inherently anti-democratic because they limit options when you should have a plethora of options in a democracy. But putting all of that aside, if people don't even believe that their votes are going to be counted, that's a problem. It does not bode well for the long-term health of democracy. So if you're not on Twitter, a lot went down over the weekend. I didn't necessarily partake in the conversation, but in a nutshell, Jimmy Dore put pressure on AOC and other members of the squad to withhold their votes for Nancy Pelosi, deny her the speakership if she doesn't promise a floor vote on Medicare for All. Now, I didn't talk about this online, but I've been thinking deeply about this and I have quite a bit to say. Uh, so let me give you some context in case you're not on Twitter. So Jimmy Dore tweeted out, progressives in Congress can actually force a Medicare for all vote if they withhold their vote for Pelosi as speaker to do it. I ask all progressives to pressure your favorite progressive congressperson to withhold their vote for Pelosi and demand a Medicare for all vote. Now, what's interesting is that AOC actually responded to this pressure, but not directly to Jimmy Dore. She responded to Justin Jackson, who's an NFL player, who basically relayed Jimmy's message to her. And he says, if AOC and the squad don't do what Jimmy Dore has suggested and withhold their vote for Pelosi for speakership unless Medicare for All gets brought up to the floor for a vote, they will be revealing themselves. Power concedes nothing without a demand. AOC then responded saying, problem with this idea is that there isn't enough thought given to step two. The Democratic votes aren't there yet. And with a razor thin margin, the Dem knows are greater than the margin. So you issue threats, hold your vote and lose. Then what? If you want to know who's opposed, look at the co-sponsor list. In contrast, you can use leverage to push for things that can happen and change lives, i.e. a $15 an hour minimum wage vote in the first 100 days, which is doable, elevating longtime progressive champions to important positions of leadership, also doable. That's the opportunity cost to weigh. Justin Jackson then responded to that saying, why aren't they there? The people of the party are there. It's not acceptable. Leadership isn't there. If they have no threat of not staying in leadership, what's the point? Pelosi was speaker for two years with no Medicare for all vote. What is your plan to force her to get a vote? AOC then responded saying, why aren't they there is the real question. We watched the presidential debates and saw how many fiercely defend our for-profit insurance system, but know that the movement pressure, positive support, primaries, popularity, organizing, etc. is working. More co-sponsors now than ever. Justin Jackson responded saying, would love for Democrats to be on the record denying their constituents health care during a pandemic. Sounds like good politics for the progressive movement and our goals. AOC responded saying, I respect that. And in an important way, they are on the record. There are 118 House Democrats who have publicly signed on to guaranteed health care during this term. They are listed here. Justin Jackson says that sounds like 118 House Democrats who can use their leverage to get a Medicare for All floor vote. It's unacceptable that a 118 coalition of Democrats who support Medicare for All cannot even get a vote. Something to consider. So I like the way that Justin Jackson thinks, and I'm just going to put this out there into the ether. If he were to run for Congress with his name recognition and celebrity status, he could get elected and do a lot of good. But let me just say this. Um, I, I do hear people who are a little bit skeptical on the left 
about this plan because in the event a floor vote for Medicare for All actually does come up and it fails, could the Democratic Party establishment then use that as evidence, basically, that, you know, it's just, you know, it's not popular enough. And if Democrats don't support it, then we shouldn't have it. Yes, that's a possibility. But I think that we can use it more to our advantage than they can use it to their advantage, right? The failure to pass Medicare for all during a pandemic, that's better for us when we're playing politics than it is for them in actuality. Because when you have the support of the people behind you, I think that you need to use that to your advantage. Now, for the leftists who don't think that this is a good idea because it will ultimately fail, so basically what this comes down to is political theater, right? That's that's the counter argument. And that's fine. I kind of see that argument, although I side more with Justin Jackson in this is good for us in terms of optics and getting them to go on the record denying their constituents health care during a pandemic. But even if it's the case that you don't necessarily agree with the strategy of, you know, getting a floor vote on Medicare for all, ultimately what Jimmy Dore is doing is really important. He's getting them to not just roll over and die and accept that Nancy Pelosi will be the Speaker of the House. It is overwhelmingly likely that she will become the Speaker of the House again. But with that inevitability, understand that there are things that you can do. Use your leverage as a block that is growing in Congress to perhaps deny her Speaker of the House unless she gives you something, anything. Fight. That's the main thing. Because ultimately, we're all disappointed. Like individuals who helped these folks get elected, you're just not challenging leadership enough. You're not challenging leadership enough. And so what this is a cry for is for you to just do something, fight harder. And I get it, right? There are these interpersonal relationships, there's pressure. And part of the reason why the left is losing is because they always get steamrolled by the establishment. I mean, look at what happened with the negotiations for the HEROES Act. Pramila Jayapal and Mark Pocan did actually fight Nancy Pelosi to include a paycheck replacement provision in the HEROES Act, but they got steamrolled and they just kind of were left hanging. Like, even if you don't win this battle, be vocal, and try to use this as evidence for the next fight to kind of set yourself up. Well, since we didn't get this, I want this this time. Like, the problem with the left in Congress is that they just don't challenge leadership enough. Nancy Pelosi does not get the resistance that is deserved for someone as out of touch and corporatist as she is. And Kyle Kalinske made a really good point. He said, like, look at the way that the Tea Party put pressure on Republican leaders. You had two Republican leaders step down because, you know, the Tea Party was so uncompromising. And we just, we don't have that equivalent on the left because there's just, there's, I don't know if there's, the block isn't big enough so they don't feel confident, but you have to fight. Like, you have to put these things out there. Like, don't just accept that Nancy Pelosi will be the speaker. Now, if all you need is like, 10 to 15 votes to deny Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, in that position again. Do something to get her to bend to your will. Get some more concessions. And behind the scenes, you know, maybe that's happening. AOC says that we are doing this in terms of, you know, committee appointments and whatnot. And that's fine. But the overall thing that I want, you know, leftist members of Congress to take away from this is that we need to see some life in you. We need to know that you're willing to fight because... I mean, for all the great things that they do, the good policies that they advocate for, they just don't challenge leadership enough. And Dem leadership, they're the problems. So if you don't fight them, you will never get the policies that you want, regardless of how many members of you know Congress we elect that are leftists. So I just want to see some fight. Like, if you don't agree with Jimmy Dore's Medicare for All demand and a floor vote on that, that's fine. But fight, show us some signs of life. And look, I actually do agree that the floor vote on Medicare for All is probably a really good thing to do just going forward. We could campaign on this. We could show, you know, the constituents here when we primary corporate Democrats that they denied health care to their constituents. Now, sure, if they know it's not going to pass, they could vote for it. And that kind of that strategy could fail. But I mean, look, I just want them to fight. I want you to fight. No more calling Nancy Pelosi mama bear. No more playing 4D chess in politics. And actually show us that you're fighting. And, you know, the counter argument from AOC and members of the squad will be, well, you don't see it, but we are fighting. Behind the scenes, there's negotiations that are taking place that you're not privy to. And sure, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors. But 
after time and again, you keep losing and you're not getting any say in bills that are popular that Democrats vote on. Whenever Pelosi continues to reject you in favor of more centrist Democrats, that's evidence to me that whatever you're doing behind the scenes is not enough. So fight. Show some signs of life. Show us that you're there to put pressure on leadership and fight. And if you don't want to fight in this specific way and you don't agree with this particular strategy, do something else. Just challenge leadership. I don't think that is too big of an ask for a movement that got you in Congress. Challenge leadership. And that really is the biggest takeaway. I want them to challenge leadership. They don't do it enough. I don't want to hear you call Nancy Pelosi mama bear and appear on magazine photo shoots with her. I want to see you fight these individuals because Nancy Pelosi is an objectively terrible human being who is denying millions of Americans Medicare for all during a pandemic. And yes, it is the case that Mitch McConnell will vote it down. But Nancy Pelosi is complicit because she won't even allow a vote on it. So look, I really, um, I give credit to Jimmy Dore for this. Uh, he was actually trending on Twitter because of this campaign. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we need to acknowledge that we are the bosses of politicians. And it's not unreasonable for us to ask for more, even from members of Congress that we respect. This isn't unreasonable. We're not being unreasonable. The individuals who deny Medicare for all to their constituents during a pandemic, they're the ones that are being unreasonable. So I'll leave that there. Um, I think that expecting politicians to do better, even ones that we support, that's a good thing. And I'm never going to disagree that we shouldn't always ask for more because we should. If I were a member of Congress and I knew that I just had a couple of weeks left before my term was over and I would not be returning to Congress, I would be doing everything in my power that during a pandemic, people had food, they had shelter, they had health care. And if you're Tulsi Gabbard, you could be promoting some of the good things that you've championed in the past. You could be promoting your bill to basically have the United States government drop all charges against Julian Assange which could literally save the First Amendment. Like, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that. Having said that, though, with just a few weeks remaining in Congress, this is what Tulsi Gabbard is choosing to focus on. As Dominique Mosbergen of HuffPost reports, Representative Tulsi Gabbard introduced legislation in the House on Thursday that would bar schools from receiving federal funding if they allow transgender girls and women and non-binary people to compete on sports teams consistent with their gender identities. The bill, co-sponsored by Republican Representative Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma was met with immediate outrage from transgender activists and allies who labeled the legislation blatantly transphobic. The Protect Women Sports Act seeks to clarify that Title IX protections for female athletes are based on biological sex, Gabbard and Mullen said in a statement. Title IX protects people from discrimination based on sex in educational programs that receive federal financial assistance. The new bill would bar schools from receiving such funds if they permit a person whose biological sex at birth is male to participate participate in an athletic program or activity that is designed for women or girls. A similar bill was introduced in the Senate earlier this year by Senator Kelly Loeffler of Georgia and other Republicans. Loeffler is one of two Republican senators facing competitive runoff elections in Georgia in January. Explaining her support for the bill, Gabbard, who'd previously claimed she supported LGBTQ rights, said she wants to protect Title IX's original intent, which was based on the general biological distinction between men and women athletes based on sex. Yeah, so this is, um, it's morally reprehensible. You're basically choosing to dedicate your remaining time in Congress to this, making sure that the lives of transgender high school students is worse than it already is. Like, it's not bad enough that they already hate themselves. Tulsi Gabbard wants to go further and make sure that they are excluded from sports. And, you know, it, it sucks because even though Tulsi Gabbard, she lost a lot of credibility on the left, she still has a lot of clout and credibility nationally speaking. This is someone who ran for president. And this is nothing more than Bathroom Panic 2.0. It's a non-issue that members of the right usually try to elevate to make you fearful of transgender people. In this instance, trans women in sports. And I'm honestly shocked at how many leftists even agree with Tulsi Gabbard here. It's honestly... It's shocking to me. So make no mistake about it. This hurts trans people. It does. I mean, it, let's say hypothetically speaking, this bill were to pass. Now, if you are in high school and you're a trans girl and maybe your only outlet that helps you with mental health is to be an athlete, participate in sports, what this would do is deny your participation. Make it so that way, by law, your gender identity is rejected. 
And, you know, if you participated in the discourse surrounding this, you know, if you're a trans girl in high school, you get to see, you know, a bunch of so-called leftists call you a man. How disgusting is that? Do you understand why this makes trans people hate themselves? Because you're codifying hatred into law. Now, thankfully, this isn't going to pass because Tulsi Gabbard is out of Congress in a couple of weeks. So this is largely symbolic. This is her setting herself up, you know, using this as a launching point for whatever she wants to do next in her career, probably as a Republican. But this, it just fosters hatred against the trans community and for no reason. Again, this is Bathroom Panic 2.0 and it doesn't even make sense because you're basically assuming that all trans women have the same exact body types. All trans women will always have a physiological and physical advantage over cisgender women when that's not true. Even cis women have different body types. Not all cis women are the same. And as a result, not all trans women are the same. Like just looking at men, I am a shorter male. So in sports, of course, it would be very difficult for me to compete against an athlete who's like six foot something and much stronger than me. So we have different builds. So all this does is unnecessarily target trans people for no good reason. And all the arguments that I've heard in defense of this have been addressed in a phenomenal piece by the ACLU where they actually debunk a lot of the biggest myths surrounding trans athletes. Now, when it comes to the biggest myth that I've seen, people argue that the participation of trans athletes hurts cis women. But that's actually not true. The fact is that including trans athletes benefits everyone, and yes, that includes cis women, because, quote, many who oppose the inclusion of trans athletes erroneously claim that allowing trans athletes to compete will harm cisgender women. This divide and conquer tactic gets it exactly wrong. Excluding women who are trans hurts all women. It invites gender policing that could subject any woman to invasive tests or accusations of being too masculine or too good at their sport to be a real woman. In Idaho, the ACLU represents two young women, one trans and one cis, both of whom are hurt by the law that was passed targeting trans athletes. Further, this myth reinforces stereotypes that women are weak and in need of protection. Politicians have used the protection trope time and again, including in 2016 when they tried banning trans people from public restrooms by creating the debunked bathroom predator myth. The real motive is never about protection. It's about excluding trans people from yet another public space. The arena of sports is no different. Now, another myth that I've seen is that trans athletes' physiological characteristics provide an unfair advantage over cis athletes. Now, the fact is that trans Trans athletes do not have an unfair advantage in sports. That is a fact. Quote, trans athletes vary in athletic ability just like cisgender athletes. One high jumper could be taller and have longer legs than another, but the other could have perfect form and then do better, explains Andrea Yearwood, a student track athlete. One sprinter could have parents who spend so much money on personal training for their child, which in turn would cause that child to run faster, she adds. In Connecticut, where cisgender girl runners have tried to block Andrea from participating in the sport she loves, the very same cis girls who have claimed that trans athletes have an unfair advantage have consistently performed as well as or better than transgender competitors. A person's genetic makeup and internal and external reproductive anatomy are not useful indicators of athletic performance, according to Dr. Joshua D. Safer. For a trans woman athlete who meets NCAA standards, there is no inherent reason why her physiological characteristics related to athletic performance should be treated differently from the physiological characteristics of a non-transgender woman. Now, people oftentimes respond to this argument by sharing videos of like trans UFC or MMA fighters knocking out a cisgender opponent. And the most popular video that I've been sent is the one of Fallon Fox. Now, I don't know the details surrounding that particular situation, but to me, when you just see both of these women, they look similarly matched in terms of like just their weight and their height. But for some reason, because one of them is trans, it's not that she just has more skill and practice more. It's specifically because she's trans. But when you look at, you know, non-trans fighting events, like the Jake Paul fight, for example, where he knocked out his opponent, you know, because he's cisgender, nobody's saying, oh, well, that's because you have this unfair physical advantage. It's actually proof that he just is a better fighter. Do you understand why this is a double standard? Because if a trans woman excels at a particular sport, well, it can't be because she's skilled and talented and she practiced. It's specifically because she has this 
unfair advantage. Whereas if a cisgender athlete excels, it's because that individual is just a better fighter. There's no question about it. Now, ultimately, I can't read the entire article to you, but I will link to it down below because I think it's really, uh, it's illuminating. If you don't know about this, then this sheds light on these common misconceptions about trans athletes. But we'll end here. There is no one way for women's bodies to be. Women, including women who are transgender, intersex, or disabled, have a range of different physical characteristics. A person's sex is made up of multiple biological characteristics, and they may not all align as typically male or female in any given person, says Dr. Safer. Further, many people who are not trans can have hormones levels outside of the range considered typical of a cis person of their assigned sex. When a person does not identify with the sex they were assigned at birth, they must be able to transition socially, and that includes participating in sports consistent with their gender identity. According to Dr. Deanna Adkins, excluding trans athletes can be deeply harmful and disruptive to treatment. I know from experience with my patients that it can be extremely harmful for a transgender young person to be excluded from the team consistent with their gender identity. So, in other words, there is no good reason to exclude trans athletes from sports. The only reason to exclude them is to make yourself feel better. To make it feel as if you're doing something and you're protecting cis women, women when in actuality, you're hurting cis women too. So I am extremely disappointed that Tulsi Gabbard did this. Like, I already lost all respect for her after she started propping up, you know, these right-wing outlets like Project Veritas. And when she moved away from Medicare for All in favor of some different plan that allows private insurance, I was extremely frustrated when she came out as anti-BDS. I mean, the disappointments just keep coming. So I I'm not necessarily that surprised that Tulsi Gabbard did this, even though it's disgusting that this is what she's choosing to focus her time on with just a few weeks left in Congress. But what disappointed me the most is the lack of nuance and understanding among people of the left. Like, you would expect them to know better and be more, you know, uh, I don't know, empathetic and sympathetic towards trans people. But they just... They, they seem to uh, have their blinders on, and I get it. A lot of people don't know someone who's trans, so you don't have someone there to educate you. You kind of just base things off of what you've known, what society has conditioned you to believe, but you've got to be more nuanced here. You've got to accept that trans women are women. And when you actually believe that, things like this aren't controversial. Of course, we should allow trans women in sports. Now, it's just sad that there's a lot more TERFs on the left than I previously thought. But either way, I don't care how many dislikes this video gets. I don't care if it makes me unpopular. I'm going to do what I think is right and argue for what I think is right. This is not right. This hurts trans people. And Tulsi Gabbard knows that. But she wants, you know, the people who are on the right that support her to support her in her next Endeavor. I don't know if that's a gig at Fox News or if she's going to run as a Republican. I don't know. But either way, this is gross. Fuck Tulsi Gabbard. So even though it seems like this happened years ago, the Iowa caucus debacle actually took place this year in February. Yeah. Now, as to why the Iowa caucus turned out to be a dumpster fire, we never really got answers until now. There were some really shady connections between Pete Buttigieg and the developers of the app, who also came from Hillary Clinton's former campaign. We don't necessarily know if the Iowa State Democratic Party was involved in making this the shit show that it was. We don't know if the DNC, the National Party Organization, had anything to do with it. But what we do know is that the Iowa debacle was embarrassing and we should have had results on that night. But now we have some answers, and a state Democratic Party audit has found that the uh, lowest common denominator is the DNC. They're responsible for Iowa being what it was. So as Tyler Pegger of Politico reports, Democratic National Committee meddling combined with missteps by the state Democratic Party were the primary drivers of the chaos that torpedoed the Iowa caucuses earlier this year, according to a new audit commissioned by the state party. The report, which was distributed to the Iowa Democratic Party State Central Committee at a meeting Saturday morning and obtained by Politico, identified a series of errors made by the DNC, ID 
NDP and the technology company contracted by the state party to build a reporting app to collect caucus results. The February caucuses were overrun by foul-ups. The state party was unable to report a winner on caucus night. The mobile app to report results failed to work for many precinct chairs. The backup telephone systems were jammed and some precincts had initial reporting errors. The state party chair, Troy Price, resigned in the wake of the debacle, which put Iowa's status as the first in the nation nominating contest in serious jeopardy. But the report pins blame squarely on the DNC for the heart of the problem on caucus night, the delay in the reporting of the results. According to the report, the DNC demanded the technology company Shadow build a conversion tool just weeks before the caucuses to allow the DNC to have real-time access to the raw numbers because the National Party feared the app would miscalculate results. The DNC's data system used a different database format than Shadow's reporting app, which caused multiple problems. The audit states the conversion tool had coding errors that spit out inaccurate numbers and caused confusion about the accuracy of the results, eventually leading to delays in reporting, but the state party's app never malfunctioned nor was hacked, the report concludes. The audit was conducted by Bonnie Campbell, the former Attorney General of Iowa, and Fager Drinker, an international law firm. The team conducted dozens of interviews with top IDP staffers, employees of Shadow, and representatives from the Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and Pete Buttigieg campaigns. The DNC refused to participate in interviews by the lawyers who conducted the audit. Now, I know that you're thinking, why does this matter now? It matters a lot because if we don't have this information, then how can we correct these problems going forward? How can we ensure that this doesn't happen again? And let me just say that it's super convenient to find this out now when the Democratic Party and the general election is over. But I don't care how long it takes. We got the information. We know who the culprit was. Now will we see accountability? Is Tom Perez going to step down because under his watch, the DNC ruined the first caucus in the entire cycle? Like, will he step down? Will anyone get fired because of this? Who made the decisions? Are they going to be penalized? I mean, these are all questions that I'm asking, but they're rhetorical questions because we know that there's going to be no accountability. The DNC continues to mess up their own primary races and nothing happens. The same individuals who were in charge... They just get shuffled around and somebody else who's going to make the same exact bad decisions is going to take their place. So, you know, we get this information. It's helpful. I think that it's really easy to see now why it was the shit show that it was, because if you make these last minute changes, of course, there's going to be issues. But what are we going to do about it? That's the question. Is this going to yield any sort of accountability whatsoever? And I say this full well knowing nothing's going to happen. I mean, we have the information what we do with it, I mean, it's up to us, but nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to be fired. Nobody's going to be, um, you know, penalized for this. Are we even going to take the precautions necessary to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Probably not. And that's what really makes this frustrating, right? Because this absolutely, you know, I don't think that if Iowa went a different way, it would have changed the outcome. But could it potentially, you know, in the future hurt a leftist candidate who maybe gets that boost from Iowa or any candidate who gets a boost from Iowa, which is usually what happens. Sure. So, you know, we rely on them to just do the basic thing, the bare minimum that is expected of people who control elections. You give us the vote totals. That's what we're looking for. And if it takes time, then we're fine with that. Just let us know in advance. Don't leave us hanging. Like, that's why this was such a debacle is because we didn't even know. Like, we were expecting results on election night. We didn't get the results. We were told that the DNC was doing a quality assurance check or something like that, which turned out to be a lie. And then they released some of the results, like 45% of precincts. And then they released a little bit more. They refused to tell us when we'd get more results. So all of this is embarrassing. And even if Democrats won this election, at least when it comes to the executive branch, it still hurts the party's legitimacy and credibility overall. So you'd think they'd want to do something, like fire someone, even if they pick a scapegoat, just like prove to us that they care and they're taking this seriously. But they won't even do that. They won't even, you know, do political theater just for purposes of optics. They don't care what we think. And that's what this tells me. So this isn't surprising. You know, of course, the DNC fucked up one of their own elections. It's just a matter of will anything come of this? And I um, if I was a betting man, I'd say no, nothing whatsoever will come of this, unfortunately. 
if you were thankful that Donald Trump killed two prominent political dynasties, well, don't thank him too much because he has basically started a new, perhaps even worse political dynasty. And we can expect all of his kids at some point to get involved in politics directly. And the first one that we're all looking at is Ivanka Trump, because there are reports that she may be mulling a run for the United States Senate in Florida. And she's going to primary challenge another prominent Republican. So as The Guardian reports, speculation about the post-White House career of Ivanka Trump is now centered on Florida, where the soon-to-be ex-first daughter and senior aide to her president and father has reportedly bought an expensive plot of land for a house and may be considering a run for Senate. Ivanka Trump is frequently mentioned as desiring a political career of her own, and during her time working for Donald Trump, has sought to position herself as a more media-friendly version of her father. Now, U.S. media reports are focusing on Florida, where Donald Trump owns the Mar-a-Lago Resort as a potential base for his daughter to launch a political career of her own. Ivanka definitely has political ambitions, no question about it, a source told CNN. She wants to run for something, but that still needs to be figured out. Florida might offer one potential avenue in a Senate race in 2022, when current Republican incumbent Marco Rubio's seat is up for re-election. Rubio was a harsh critic of Donald Trump in the 2016 Republican nomination race but later morphed into a loyal supporter of Trump once he had won the election. I think she'd be the immediate frontrunner if she ran for U.S. Senate against Rubio given her father's popularity in the Sunshine State. Adam C. Smith, former Tampa Bay Times political editor and now consultant with Mercury Public Affairs, told CNN. So this is fascinating to me. Um, first of all, let me say uh, what is obvious. I hate political dynasties and the thought of Ivanka Trump running for anything is nauseating. Having said that, though, I do like that the Republicans who reluctantly endorsed Donald Trump rather than fighting him, now, now that's biting them in the ass. Like Marco Rubio, by supporting Donald Trump, now you've given him credibility, and now his own children may run against you. Congratulations, dummy. But I will say that even though I don't want Ivanka Trump to run for anything and I'd rather her go away, I do like that she's challenging Marco Rubio. Because what are you going to say to Donald Trump's daughter? Like, it's going to be a contest about who is most loyal to Donald Trump. Who will they believe is more loyal? Marco Rubio, who previously stated that he hated Donald Trump and is biting his tongue now that he's president. Or Ivanka Trump, who is his daughter. And this would be funny to watch because Marco Rubio, no question, like he would embarrass himself. Look, I, I like your dad. I supported your father. But she's going to bring up all the stuff from the 2016 and 2015 Republican Party primaries. It's going to be hilarious to watch. And let me just say this. I want to see them fight. I want to see MAGA chuds and the more establishment Republicans rip each other to shreds. Now, this may be a pipe dream because what is my expectation, and this may be wrong, is that you know, much like with the Tea Party, the Republican Party, like the rift wasn't there for that long. They kind of absorbed the Tea Party. And I think this may be true with MAGA chuds. Like they are an emerging faction within the Republican Party. But I think that overall, when you compare like the Democratic Party establishment and the Republican establishment, Republicans are much more savvy at kind of mending those rifts, right? They make some concessions, give some power positions to this emerging faction. And ultimately, the party as a whole shifts to the right. But with the Democratic Party, they kind of try to float against the current or swim against the current, I should say. And rather than embracing these emergent factions like leftists, they fight them. So it would be interesting to see what happens. But in this instance, if we see a, you know, a primary fight between Marco Rubio and Ivanka Trump, and if it came down to them, oddly enough, I'd be rooting for Marco Rubio to win because I fucking hate political dynasties. And to see a Trump kid in the Senate, it's just, I hate it. Like, <laughs> I hate it. So uh, either way, I do want them to fight each other. And I say we let them fight. And I hope that this does long-term damage to the Republican Party. But um, it probably won't. So, you know, either way, at least we could be entertained if we have no horse in this race. And watch Marco Rubio hopefully embarrass himself. Whether he likes it or not, Donald Trump will soon be out of a job. He will no longer be president. And so that begs the question, what's next for Donald Trump? And really, that has a lot of possible answers too, because I don't think that 
liberals and the Democratic Party have fully come to grips with the reality that even after Donald Trump leaves, he's still going to have a vice grip on the Republican Party. The Republican Party loves him, and any politician who wants to run for president, anyone who currently has greater political ambitions and wants to be president, they've got to kiss Donald Trump's ring. It's why you've seen individuals like Ted Cruz, who previously hated Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump called his wife ugly or something to that effect. He has basically unequivocally capitulated and supports Donald Trump vocally. Same is true for Lindsey Graham, who also may have political ambitions. Uh, so regardless, what we're seeing here is a total takeover of the Republican Party by Donald Trump. And he is launching his own super PAC to still wield influence over the Republican Party. But what's interesting is that any Republican Party politician who wants to run for president in 2024, well, on one hand, they have to embrace Donald Trump because the base loves Donald Trump. But on another hand, by embracing Donald Trump and possibly encouraging him to run for 2024, you are going to have to step aside for Donald Trump. And in the event Trump does choose to run for president in 2024, I think he's the front runner. And I've seen, you know, liberals say, well, that's not going to happen, Mike, because how is he going to run for president from a jail cell? But I'm yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I'd be pleasantly surprised if Donald Trump was accountable for any of his crimes, but I don't think that's realistic. So uh, in the event Donald Trump does run for president in 2024, what would happen? Well, let's look at some really early polls. A poll from Ledger 360 in mid-November found that 25% of Republicans support Donald Trump and 19% support Romney, 14% support Pence, and basically everyone else is 8% or below. But as you can see, Donald Trump still has a lot of support. Now, what's interesting is that in this same poll, if you remove Trump from the equation, all of a sudden Pence gets a really big boost. And Pence is someone who is seen as from that wing of the Trump party. And, you know, you see Romney get a little bit of a boost, as does Ted Cruz. But the anti-Trump Republicans, they're just, there's not enough there. So whoever runs for the 2024 Republican Party nomination, if they don't pledge their loyalty to Donald Trump, or if they're not Donald Trump, they're not going to go anywhere. Now, in a poll from late November from McLaughlin, they found that Donald Trump is doing even better. He is polling at 53%, completely out of this world. Now, if you remove Trump from that same poll, well, look what happens. All of a sudden, Pence, who is from Trump world, is polling at 20%. Trump Jr. is polling at 20% as well. So at this point in time, assuming nothing changes, somebody from Trump world is poised to be the Republican Party nominee, if not Donald Trump himself. And I don't think that Republicans realize that it's more than them just basically pledging their loyalty to Donald Trump by going along with this claim that, you know, the election was stolen from him. That hurts them. They know that this this is not factual, right? Aides to Republican senators and members of Congress have said, yeah, we, we know that this is complete horseshit, but they have to go along with it because they know that that's what the base believes and Republicans don't want to piss off their base. Unlike Democrats, they always spit in the eyes of their base. But regardless, you know, they, they are trying to go along with this. But like if you're someone like, uh, I don't know, Ted Cruz, and you go along with this, do you not realize what you're doing? You are giving Donald Trump the best argument to be the nominee in 2024 if he wants it. Because he's going to step in and say, look, I am the rightful president. I should be president right now. But this election was stolen from me. So why are all these Republicans running against me? Shouldn't they be supporting me? Like, it's a pretty easy argument to make, assuming Trump doesn't do anything to piss off his own base, which I don't think that's the case, because when it's a cult, he can say and do anything. He can come out in favor of, you know, um, I don't know, um, abortion, <laughs> and they still wouldn't leave him because he said it. So it's interesting because the Republican Party, they know that they're going to have to bite their tongues. Josh Hawley, he's someone who um, he wants to run for president. I think his moves now, the things that he's doing, he very clearly wants something to brag about in the future, but he knows that Donald Trump, he has a stronghold on the party and him and individuals like Rick Scott from Florida, even if they might have, you know, a little bit more grand ambitions when it comes to their own political careers, 
they're encouraging Donald Trump to run for president in 2024. So they know that they can't say anything. If you so much as speak any ill will of Donald Trump, you lose credibility and you take years to rebuild that credibility, right? That's what Ted Cruz is working on right now. So long story short, this is Donald Trump's party. This is Donald Trump's party. And if you're one of the liberals who feels like now that Trump is out of office, we can go back to brunch and you're relieved. The politics won't change. Sure, Donald Trump, at least for now, is not the president. But the Republican Party is now Donald Trump's party, which means that we're not going to believe in objective reality. We will deny facts. And, you know, it's not just that we're going to suppress the votes to rig elections with voter ID laws and voter purges of the rules. Now we're openly authoritarian. We're against democracy. And if we have the ability to, we're not against straight up stealing elections from Democrats. So I think that this fact is something that everyone needs to reckon with. Donald Trump may be gone, at least for the next four years, but his legacy isn't going anywhere. The legacy of Trump will endure, which is shocking because this is an idiotic clown of a human being who's a former reality television show star, but he has control over one of two major parties in the United States. I think that speaks to um, how far we've fallen as an empire that this clown can take over one of two major parties. Ajit Pai, soon to be former chairman of the FCC, will soon be out of a job. Now, for those of you who don't remember who Ajit Pai is, this is the individual who tried to ruin the internet. He repealed net neutrality after we worked for years to get this accomplished. But thankfully, his effort to destroy the internet was uh, challenged by courts. And for the most part, he kind of lost. And I say kind of because in his repeal of net neutrality, there was a clause that blocked states from enacting their own net neutrality laws. But a court shot that down while upholding his overall repeal of net neutrality. So now you have some major states like New York and California where they have net neutrality and other states where they don't have net neutrality. So the effort to, you know, undo net neutrality, this is an ongoing project for Republicans. Now, if it's the case that Joe Biden does what I hope he'll do and appoint Jessica Rosenworcel to be the next FCC commissioner or FCC chair, I should say, and elevate her from her commissioner status, this would be great for net neutrality because she is a vocal proponent of net neutrality. And so I have no doubt that she would restore net neutrality and they would have the votes on the FCC to do just that. However, knowing that Ajit Pai's legacy is going to be undone, will one ally of Ajit Pai, Brendan Carr, an FCC commissioner currently, is calling on Senate GOPers to stop Joe Biden from making her the next FCC chairperson. So as Ross Story reports, in a recent interview with Neil Cavuto on Fox Business, Federal Communications Commission Chairman Brendan Carr said it would be valuable for Senate Republicans to block President-elect Joe Biden from appointing a new FCC chairperson. That way, the GOP can forestall Biden's agenda in the agency, including restoring net neutrality, so that corporations can't charge companies for an equal presence on the internet. In short, if Republicans win Georgia's runoff elections on January 5th, they could stall the vote for Biden's new pick for the FCC head. If this happens, Biden won't be able to seat someone to help implement his agenda. So ultimately, this is going to come down to what happens in the runoff elections with Kelly uh, Loeffler and David Perdue. If they win, then this could potentially happen. They can block Joe Biden from making Jessica Rosenworcel or anyone else who supports net neutrality the chair. And that would preserve Ajit Pai's legacy. This is extremely shady and understand how egregious this is. You have an FCC chairperson openly calling for the next president to be obstructed. So that way their legacy is intact. And this is a legacy that is extremely overtly corporatist. Repealing that neutrality is exactly what Verizon and Comcast and AT&T and all these internet service providers want. And let me remind you that Ajit Pai, he came from the industry. He was legal counsel to Verizon and then he gets an office and unsurprisingly he does their bidding. Overturns the 2015 order that made uh, the internet a utility under Title II of the Communications Act. And now they want to stop that knowing that they lost and Ajit Pai's legacy is about to be undone. This is what they come up with. And 
it's not like I can say, well, you know, we just need to put public pressure on the FCC to not encourage Senate Republicans to block Jessica Rosenworcel from becoming the next chair because there was an unprecedented amount of pressure put on the FCC prior to their repeal of net neutrality, but they did it anyway. So I don't necessarily know what can be done to stop them from actually doing this, but I do know that it's disgusting because if the party who supports net neutrality wins an election and they are blocked from appointing a new chairperson to the FCC, which they know is going to undo what the last chair did. I, like, what do we do? What's our, what's our, you know, course of action at that point? I mean, we kind of got a victory when the courts somewhat undid Ajit Pai's legacy, but, you know, it's still, it's troubling because we're running out of options, Right. We're running out of options, and currently, as it stands, if internet service providers did want to section off portions of the internet and start charging you as, you know, they, they charge you for cable packages and say, look, you don't have to buy the whole internet, but if you want to buy the social media package where you get Facebook and Twitter, there's nothing stopping them from doing that now except for certain states. So do you create specific, you know, packages for markets where they don't have net neutrality or do you just keep it all the same because the biggest markets you know california new york they do have net neutrality look this is troubling but regardless we need to know what they're planning and acknowledge that this all comes down to you know these georgia runoffs because if they can't do this then you can expect you know jessica rosenworcel if she is the new chair to undo ajit pai's legacy but if not they could very well be successful here and preserve uh, Ajit Pai's legacy. Now, whether or not Joe Biden can basically uh, subvert their obstruction and just appoint an acting FCC chair, I don't know. But, you know, this is all to be seen. It all comes down to what happens on January 5th. So, um, yeah, this is uh, really infuriating to me. So just a forewarning, we are going to get a little bit doomer in this video. So if you don't want your mood to be spoiled, I would encourage you to tune out but we have to talk about this because it's really important um and it is about climate change now more than 250 scientists in 30 different countries all penned an open letter that was published in the guardian where they warn governments that since they failed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions over the last five years we are going to see the consequences of our inaction bear out and it's not going to be pretty. So they write, as scientists and scholars from around the world, we call on policymakers to engage with the risk of disruption and even collapse of societies. After five years failing to reduce emissions in line with the Paris Climate Accord, we must now face the consequences. While bold and fair efforts to cut emissions and naturally draw down carbon are essential, researchers in many areas consider societal collapse a credible scenario this century. Different views exist on the location, extent, timing, permanence, and cause of disruptions, but the way modern societies exploit people and nature is a common concern. Only if policymakers begin to discuss this threat of societal collapse might we begin to reduce its likelihood, speed, severity, harm to the most vulnerable, and to nature. Some some of us believe that a transition to a new society may be possible that will involve bold action to reduce damage to the climate, nature, and society, including preparations for disruptions to everyday life. We are united in regarding efforts to suppress discussion of collapse as hindering the possibility of that transition. Now, Jessica Corbett of Common Dreams adds, the letter, a version of which appeared in The Guardian Sunday, comes on the heels of a pair of United Nations reports warning of the dire direction in which the planet is headed. As the UN Secretary General put it, the state of the planet is broken. Humanity is waging a war on nature. This is suicidal. So what they're warning about is a total collapse of society due to climate change. And this, this really struck a chord with me because now that we see the way that our government responds to a global pandemic, now we have no doubt they are completely incapable of dealing with a crisis that's much more severe, climate change. I mean, the way that we've responded is what we'd expect to see from a failed state. So if you envision a bigger catastrophe like climate change and the total collapse of civilization, our government just, they're not equipped to deal with it. And that is a really scary thought.
it's scary to think about that. And, you know, when we think about climate change, we think about, you know, changing weather patterns and extreme weather conditions, you know, more severe hurricanes, more frequent hurricanes. But we oftentimes leave out the political ramifications of climate change. You know, I mean, sure, we, we've thought about this. I've thought about this quite a bit. But now that I see the way that Americans have responded to a global pandemic, all of the conspiracy theories that have proliferated and people just denying it, I can see the same thing happening with climate change. And when you envision the way that certain regions of the planet will now be uninhabitable, such as the Middle East, what we're going to see and what we should expect if we don't take action to stop this is a massive wave of immigration, which of course is going to lead to racism, xenophobia, and it's it's going to be ugly. And so, you know, what they're saying essentially is we know that government isn't taking action to stop all of this from happening. But if you're not going to stop climate change from being a catastrophe, then at least start thinking about adaptation. We can't just focus on mitigation. Now we have to be real and focus on adaptation as well. We have to be able to adapt to this. Otherwise, societies will collapse. How will governments deal with massive social unrest? What's going to happen? We'll see new political factions form. These, you know, wars over water will become probably a common phenomenon and it's going to get ugly. So this is a warning. Like we can't say that we weren't warned. And, you know, it's nobody in Congress, Dianne Feinstein, you know, Mitch McConnell, they're not going to see all of this come to fruition. We will. So rather than getting down on this, I want you to think, what do we do? What solutions are at our disposal? How can we stop this? How can we adapt in a situation where we see wars over water and civilizations crumble and regimes regimes collapse. What do we do? Now is the time to not get down and defeatist. Now is the time to start thinking about solutions. What can we do? Because we have to think long term. And if as a species, humanity is going to survive, this is the biggest challenge we've ever faced. So we we were warned. Now the question is, what do we do? to stop this? And if we can't stop it, how do we grapple with the reality of societal collapse? What do we do? We all knew that this was coming, but now it is official. Nina Turner is officially running to represent Ohio's 11th congressional district. And she made this announcement via Twitter, releasing this ad. I am a daughter of Cleveland. I was raised in this community by parents who worked very hard. My mother was a nurse's aide, my father a truck driver. I can relate to people who live in the 11th Congressional District from all walks of life. I am you. As a Cleveland City Councilwoman, I worked to secure housing for seniors. As an Ohio State Senator, I stood with working families and labor to maintain collective bargaining rights. I led the effort to create the Ohio Task Force on Community and Police Relations. I know that the struggle is real. I want to serve as your next Congresswoman because I believe that everyone deserves a good job, health care, And our children deserve to be educated from pre-K to college. I will go to Congress to help our community recover from the coronavirus, including helping small businesses and those who have been hardest hit. We are going to do great things together. Let's get to work. I am Nina Turner, and I'm running for Congress. I am hyped. I could not be more excited about this. It's something to look forward to and something that I think we need, like to see Nina Turner in Congress, the things that she'd be able to accomplish, like her leadership skills, her passion. This honestly is a game changer. Like this isn't an ordinary congressional race. This is Nina Turner. So we absolutely have to do everything in our power to make sure that she is elected. But one thing that I want to emphasize is I don't want the left to be arrogant. I don't want us to just think it's Nina Turner, so she's got this in the bag. I think that she has a phenomenal chance of winning, but if we fail her by getting too cocky and complacent, she 
won't win. So it's not a foregone conclusion that she wins. We have to fight for her. That means that if we can, we donate to her. I donated $27 the minute she made this announcement official, and uh, I signed up for reoccurring donations each month. So you have to do what you can. If you can't spare money during this time when it's really difficult, even a buck or two will help. But if you can't actually support her monetarily, then phone banking for her that is going to go a really long way. We have to make sure that we fight because this is not a guaranteed win. We cannot lose this opportunity, so we have to fight for Nina Turner. And I get that it's Nina Turner, so, you know, she's going to do well, but we, we can't just be too arrogant. That's what I want to stress here. Having said that, though, she's already off to a phenomenal start, and she has lots of very high-profile endorsements. So as Holly Otterbein of Politico reports, top progressive elected officials, groups, and entertainers are throwing their weight behind Nina Turner's congressional campaign, setting up a clash between left-wing and establishment-oriented Democrats over a House seat in Ohio just as President-elect Joe Biden is about to take office. Representative Ro Khanna, Bernie Sanders' former campaign co-chair, Representative-elect Cory Bush, a Black Lives Matter activist who unseated an incumbent Democrat, and Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison are endorsing Turner. Her campaign told Politico, Our revolution, a progressive organization founded by Sanders and previously led by Turner, will be backing her bid as well. Our revolution executive director Joseph Givarghese said the organization has more than 16 thousand supporters in Ohio who are ready to do the phone banking, texting, and door-to-door -door canvassing for Turner. Rapper Killer Mike and actor Danny Glover, who both campaigned for Sanders, are also backing Turner, and the musician is going to push for her on Instagram, Turner said in an interview. Charlemagne the God, the co-host of the popular radio show The Breakfast Club, is also getting behind her, she said. The boost from high-profile elected officials and artists could help fuel a money surge for Turner, whose fans are hoping she'll come out of the gate with impressive of fundraising numbers in the opening days of her special election race. A number of other Democrats are expected to throw their hat in the ring for the rare chance at an open congressional seat. Chantel Brown, the leader of the Cuyahoga County Democratic Party, whom Fudge supported when she ran for that post, has said she is running if the Senate confirms the Congresswoman. Because the district is heavily Democratic, the winner of the primary is all but certain to carry the general election. Another candidate, former Cleveland City Councilman Jeff Johnson, has already taken a shot at Turner, suggesting suggesting that the progressive wouldn't work with Biden if elected. You know what it sounds like to me, Jeff? It sounds like you're afraid of Nina Turner. And I don't blame you because Nina Turner is a political behemoth and she has millions of people behind her just automatically and thousands of people on the ground in Ohio ready to go to bat for her. So I don't blame you for taking shots at her, but understand that if you're going to attack Nina Turner, we will defend Nina Turner. So she has all of those endorsements, and she also got this endorsement from, of course, none other than Bernie Sanders. This was expected, but it's really nice to see. She doesn't even have to put out a platform. I mean, of course she will, but we know exactly what she stands for. Medicare for all, student debt cancellation, actually fighting for a future, a Green New Deal. This is someone who is truly like the best representative we could imagine. And to have her in Congress, I just can't overstate how much of a game changer this will be. There's a reason why so many progressive pundits like myself, Kyle Kalinske, David Dole, we are all so excited about Nina Turner because we need her in Congress. She really is the ultimate fighter and perhaps the next leader of the progressive left movement. So absolutely go to bat for Nina Turner. Donate to Nina Turner. Uh, don't just donate though. Uh, volunteer for Nina Turner. We have to put in the work to make sure that this victory becomes a reality. We cannot get complacent and just expect her to win automatically because she's Nina Turner. We have to fight for that reality. Fight for it because the establishment is not going to want to see Nina Turner win. There's going to be a lot of people probably who will throw their hats in the ring and I wouldn't be surprised if they try something like Bloody Monday where if it doesn't look like any one individual can beat Nina Turner, maybe they all consolidate support behind one establishment candidate. We have to expect the unexpected and be prepared to actually fight and not just accept that, you know, the result is guaranteed to us. So let's fight and let's get Nina Turner elected to Congress. I am all for this. President-elect Joe Biden's team is starting to take shape and he's adding some individuals to his transition team 
that he doesn't necessarily want you to know about. He's not publicizing these additions because, well, if most Americans found out about them, then they would be pretty upset. So as Politico reports, two are Goldman Sachs veterans. Others have worked for consulting firms like McKinsey and Company and Boston Consulting Group, along with one Google and three Facebook employees. One is the daughter of a pair of longtime Biden advisors. They're all among the dozens of people Biden has quietly added to his transitions agency review teams in recent weeks, according to a review of the transitions website. The team members, which must be disclosed by the transition, offer the most comprehensive picture of who Who's building the Biden administration? So once again, Goldman Sachs alumni will be in a president's team. I mean, <laughs> what is it that they are doing? If only I knew what it was that allowed them to curry favor with administration after administration, regardless of that administration's party affiliation. Hmm, what is it? Now, in terms of who these individuals are specifically, as Kenneth Vogel explains, this includes Monica Mayer and Eric Goldstein, a former Goldman Sachs VP and employee respectively, Matt Hernandez from a consulting firm, and Josh Zoffer of McKinsey. Now, one more McKinsey alum not mentioned here is none other than Pete Buttigieg, former 2020 candidate who Biden has nominated to lead the Department of Transportation. Now, Biden has not tapped Pete Buttigieg for this role because Pete Buttigieg is uniquely qualified or is like specifically passionate about transportation, contrary to what he is saying, which we're going to get to in a moment. Uh, but the reason why Pete Buttigieg is getting this job is because this is Joe Biden paying back a debt. When Obama called Pete Buttigieg and asked him to drop out and endorse Joe Biden, of course, Obama and Biden knew that this would come at a cost. And now this is a debt that is being repaid because Buttigieg backed off and cleared the field for Joe Biden, allowing him to become the Democratic Party nominee. And as a result, the president, he is getting rewarded for that. Now, we know this is the case because there are many more people who Joe Biden could have chosen other than Pete Buttigieg, who would be more qualified, because Pete Buttigieg is not qualified for this position. And that includes David Kim, who has eight years at the Department of Transportation, LA Transit. He's the head of California's State Transportation Agency. There's Sarah Feinberg, who has four years at the Department of Transportation. She led FRA. She's the head of the New York City Transit. John Porcari led Maryland's Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Transportation, Deputy Secretary. I mean, all of these individuals, they could have been chosen for this position, but Pete Buttigieg, he needed some job in Biden's administration because that's what was obviously promised to him. So he's getting uh, the Department of Transportation. I have to share with you uh, <laughs> a quote from Pete Buttigieg. He says, quote, I also had a personal love of transportation since childhood. Who says things like this? Who has thought that thoroughly about transportation? Nobody says things like this. But I think that he knows it's a little embarrassing that he was given a job that he's completely unqualified for. So he has to try to make up some justification as to why he's in this position. But I mean, it's pretty obvious. We know that you got this job because you dropped out and endorsed Joe Biden. And this was promised to you, not necessarily this job, but a job in Biden's administration. So just admit it. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to do that. But this is what happens all the time. You know, you'll, you'll see someone do a fundraiser for a politician and they will in turn get a job. Uh, this actually happened with uh, Tom Wheeler, who became the FCC chair during the Obama years after he raised almost a million dollars for Obama, uh, you know, across both uh, administrations, 2008 and 2012. Um, and then he went on to try to repeal net neutrality or at least diminish, you know, the open internet as it is. This was a former Comcast lobbyist. Now, thankfully, that ended up working out because Tom Wheeler faced so much public pressure that he became an ally to the net neutrality movement. But I mean, we see this all the time. You know, we see people getting jobs as ambassador to a country that they have no uh, knowledge of or experience in, and they don't even speak the language oftentimes. This is what we see. This is basically favors being done, and, and this is no different here. So when it comes to Pete Buttigieg, we know what's happening. When it comes to the Goldman Sachs individuals on Biden's transition team, we know that they probably did a fundraiser for him or donated to him. 
this is this is what we see in Washington DC. So this isn't necessarily surprising, but because it's not shocking, that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't be mad because this is still unacceptable even if we've kind of become accustomed to it. I want to take some time to talk about Dr. Dean Waldman. Now, you may not know who this individual is, but he is a medical doctor, he's a professor, and he is also a published author who has written extensively about the U.S. healthcare system. So just by telling you that, you might think, wow, this sounds like someone who's really informed. He must be an expert. And he certainly thinks that he's an expert, and he thought that it was really important that he share his expertise with all of us. So he penned an op-ed for The Hill, and um, it'll kind of tell you the extent of his knowledge. Uh, I'm just going to read you the title. You ready? Quote, prepare for buyer's remorse when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris nationalize health care. <laughs> <laughs> A so-called expert thinks that Joe Biden is going to nationalize health care in the United States. I'm not kidding when I say there's a greater likelihood that Trump will nationalize health care before he leaves office. To think that Joe Biden is going to nationalize health care, that's not just laughable, that's delusional. Like you're in the same delusional territory as the MAGA chuds who think that Donald Trump actually won this election. Like that's, that's a joke. It's laughable. Joe Biden is literally the candidate that the health insurance industry bet on during the Democratic Party primaries to save them from the popularity of Medicare for all. So, I mean, this really goes to show you how delusional right wingers are. And we don't have to be more charitable here. We don't even have to go beyond the headline because I think it speaks for itself. Nonetheless, we're going to be kind and let's just hear him out. He writes, nationalization of healthcare will involve some combination of the Biden healthcare plan with Bernie Sanders' single payer Medicare for All. Vice President elect Kamala Harris strongly supports Medicare for All as detailed in H.R. 1384, a February 2019 bill that was never brought to a vote in Congress. While there are some technical differences between the two plans, there are numerous common elements. The overarching theme is the federal choice replacing individual or patient choice. The very first word of the Biden plan sets a tone for for Americans' dependence on Washington. The federal government, quote, gives. Despite Biden's campaign promise to the contrary, private health insurance policies will cease to be available, I wish. Section 202 of Medicare for All prohibits private insurance by law. The Biden plan would create a public option, which is a taxpayer-supported government insurance company. By lowballing prices, Washington will drive private insurance companies out of the market. Either way, Americans will have only one insurance option, what the federal government decides for us. Now, the article goes on a little bit longer, but he basically just talks about why he believes nationalization is bad. But he kind of has this um, thinking that he has already established, and as a matter of fact, that Joe Biden is going to nationalize healthcare in the United States, which is why he goes on to explain why that's bad. But that's all the evidence that he presented that Joe Biden is going to nationalize healthcare. That's it. He supports a public option. First of all, we don't even know if Joe Biden is really committed to a public option. Second of all, if Joe Biden actually does go through with a public option and we get a public option, there's no, like guaranteed that that's going to be a robust public option that actually offers buyers a lot. And if he does offer us a public option, that isn't nationalization. That's an attempt to save our capitalist system as it is. Really, what a public option would do in actuality is it would drive the sick disadvantaged people onto the public option and a public option would be underfunded and overburdened because private insurance companies would market cheaper plans that are less comprehensive to people who don't need healthcare, people who are younger and healthier. And as a result, the so-called public option will ultimately fail unless it is constantly updated and tweaked. But we know in our late stage capitalist society, you know, Republicans will do everything in their power to strip away benefits from it and it won't last. So the fact that he thinks that a public option will basically act as a gateway to nationalization is a joke. It's a joke. Even in the best case scenario for a public option, if it was the best, most comprehensive public option imaginable, immediately when Republicans take power, they're going to chip away at it. So it's a joke. And he really shows you how stupid he is when he speaks about Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plans as if they're the same. Kamala Harris's plan is not real single-payer. 
It's a fake Medicare for All bill that was created to placate members of the left who she pissed off when she moved away from Medicare for All. But he says that uh, the reason why Bernie and Kamala's plans are the same, basically, is because the overarching theme is the federal choice replacing individual or patient choice. What does that mean exactly? Choice for what? What choice is being taken away from us? Because we don't have choice currently. We have a limited array of options if we're lucky enough to even get health insurance and we don't get to choose who our doctors are. That's restricted to whoever is within our network and offered to us. Furthermore, we don't even get the choice of choosing everything that's covered unless we want to pay an arm and a leg. So the choice that he's talking about is really your choice of private insurance. But actually, what we want in terms of choice in healthcare is to choose our doctor, choose which hospitals and doctor's offices we can go to. If everything is comprehensive and covered, that's when our choices as consumers are maximized. But this dunce, he doesn't get it. He's supposed to be an expert. But the things that he's saying, th these are like basic things that he gets wrong. All you have to do is look at any other country with either a national healthcare system like the UK or a single payer system. And you'll see that the things that you're saying are not only wrong, but they're laughably stupid. Now, um, the last thing that I want to say is that he assumes that in the event Joe Biden actually did this and we got a nationalized healthcare system, we would have, quote, buyer's remorse. Is that so? Why don't you talk to anyone in the UK? Just pick anyone off the streets and ask them if they have buyer's remorse about their national healthcare system. If you try to take away their NHS system, they would riot. So it's not going to be the case that Joe Biden gives us a national healthcare system. I wish that were true. I mean, he would be awesome. I would love Joe Biden if that were the case. But he's just a neoliberal like any other Republican when it comes to healthcare. I mean, he might not want to take away healthcare as much as Republicans, but he's not for offering comprehensive healthcare. But if you ask someone in the UK or you talk to someone in Canada about their single payer system, there's no buyer's remorse there. It's incredibly popular. And this guy is stupid, but he's got to know that that's why he wants to stop it from happening, because if it did happen, there would be no buyer's remorse. Once you give people health care, taking it away from them would be extremely unpopular, which is why there's always backlash whenever we talk about or we hear about cuts to uh, Medicare being talked about. So I don't know how a so-called expert could be this stupid when it comes to basic facts about Joe Biden's position on health care and our health care system overall, but it just um, it's. It's entertaining, at least, I guess. <laughs> For whatever reason, apparently it is newsworthy to see the Senate Majority Leader make a statement of fact and simply acknowledge that the next president is the person who Republicans don't want it to be. I mean, regardless if you like Joe Biden or not, it doesn't matter what your feelings are of the matter. The fact is that he will become the president of the United States and will be sworn in on January 20th. Just pretending as if that's not going to happen, that that doesn't do anything. Uh, but because we live in 2020 America, when Mitch McConnell finally acknowledged and congratulated Joe Biden for winning the election after the Electoral College made it official, uh, this was kind of a big story. So today I want to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden the president-elect is no stranger to the Senate. He's devoted himself to public service for many years. I also want to congratulate the vice president-elect, our colleague from California, Senator Harris. Great. Now, this comes six weeks too late when we already knew that Joe Biden was the president-elect. So, I mean, I, I don't think that Mitch McConnell deserves any credit whatsoever, but I, I really am enjoying all of of the backlash that he's experienced. You see MAGA chuds online attacking him, and I love it. I'm eating it up because this is what the Republican Party, I mean, this is the audience who you've been pandering to. Donald Trump is the Frankenstein that you created. This is your monster. And now he's unleashed on the world and you no longer have control of him. So when I see Mitch McConnell get attacked by MAGA chuds and he's called a sellout or a plant by the deep state, I love it. You love to see it because he deserves every ounce of that criticism. Um, even if this is, you know, completely delusional and batshit insane, uh, he deserves it. Uh, now, one individual who in theory should know better because this is supposed to be a serious political person and who's now a political commentator is Charlie Kirk. He did not like that Mitch McConnell acknowledged reality. 
so he decided to language police Mitch McConnell in a recent episode of his podcast. This was extremely unhinged and um, pathetic. And so if Mitch McConnell wants to wake up on January 6th and be met with two of his Senate candidates all of a sudden trailing in Georgia, keep talking like this. Go out of your way to use the term congratulate. If he had to and was getting pressure, he could have at the very most today I will recognize. I probably would have taken exception with that. But the term congratulations inherently means that you are applauding and recognizing an achievement of success. When do you use congratulations in your life? When people attain athletic accomplishments, when people get married, engaged. You typically don't use the term congratulations when someone just stole a bank, stole money from a bank. You don't go to your friends or your family members that might be engaging in criminal activity and say, congratulations. It's typically not the right way to handle things. I don't know how these folks expect everyone outside of their bubble to take them seriously ever again when you can't even accept the basic reality that Donald Trump lost this election. And maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he knows that he'll never appeal to anyone outside of that right-wing echo chamber. But still, I mean, if you want to be taken seriously, just getting outraged that someone acknowledged the fact that the next president will be someone you don't like, that shouldn't be a reason to get this angry. But I mean, here we are. Uh, so the problem that Charlie Kirk had wasn't necessarily that Mitch McConnell acknowledged the reality that Joe Biden is the president-elect, but it's a specific language that he used. So he didn't say, I recognize Joe Biden as the president-elect. He congratulated him. Now, according to Charlie Kirk, that means uh, inherently that you are applauding and recognizing an achievement of success. But isn't it kind of an achievement to be elected the president? Again, you don't like Joe Biden. I don't like Joe Biden for different reasons. But to congratulate him, I mean, sure, you could say that there are more positive connotations attached to that word. But is this really worthy of your outrage and time at all? I mean, what this sounds like to me is you language policing Mitch McConnell for not using the politically correct language that you deem as appropriate. And yet this is someone who uh, his entire career, it, it caters to college campuses and how he wants to move college students away from this outrage culture and political correctness. And here you are literally language policing someone for the most benign reason ever. It's it's honestly embarrassing. Now, he also says you typically don't use the term congratulations when someone just stole a bank. Um, first of all, if somebody managed to steal a bank, that would take a tremendous amount of skill. It would be illegal, and I'm not advocating for bank robberies, of course. But I mean, it, <laughs> the implication here embedded with that statement is that like there was a theft involved, right? So if someone, they stole a bank, which kind of doesn't make sense, you would think, oh, wow, that's that took a lot of planning and whatnot to pull off, but it's, it, it's bad, it's immoral, it's illegal. But that's... That's not what happened here. There was an election and people voted. More people voted for Joe Biden than Donald Trump. And this time in the correct areas, in the states where it mattered, the swing states. So what theft are you referring to? Are you literally saying that this election was stolen from Donald Trump? Because we haven't seen any evidence. We keep hearing about all of the evidence. But yet in what is it now, more than 50 or 60 cases, they've all been thrown out of courts. You can't prove it. So are you seriously saying that the election was stolen from Donald Trump? Are you on this bandwagon too? I would suspect so because, I mean, Charlie Kirk is one of the biggest sycophants for Donald Trump. But I mean, again, these are folks who are relatively high up in terms of, you know, their credibility within the conservative movement. He speaks at CPAC. He has street cred in conservative circles. So for you to do this, I mean, 
Trump, he is in control of the Republican Party, but that isn't going to last forever. So this is really short-sighted for you, even if you only care about your career. And furthermore, it's stupid. I mean, Charlie Kirk, I disagree with everything that he says, but you can acknowledge that there is, you know, a level of intelligence there with him that isn't there with other politicians. Like when you look at Louis Gohmert, um, or not just politicians, but like uh, pundits, you know, um, I don't know, name any of them. They're all really pretty obviously stupid. But with Charlie Kirk, you can actually tell that he is a little bit more reasonable seemingly um, on on some things. Like I wouldn't say he's a Nazi. And there's like a bare minimum amount of intelligence there where he should be better than others. But he's not. Like you're agreeing with individuals like Nick Fuentes here who are rallying around this whole stop to the steal bullshit. Look, dude, you lost. It wasn't stolen from you. You just lost. Accept it. Stop trying to police the speech of individuals who acknowledge reality and just suck it up. Deal with it. Facts don't care about your feelings, Snowflake. So whether you like it or not, Joe Biden will be the next president. Continuing to den deny reality does nothing for you. And if you truly care about your audience, which, which I'm assuming you're pandering to, then actually tell them the truth. And eventually they will acknowledge that you speaking to them as if they're adults and they can understand basic facts and acknowledge empirical reality, maybe someday in the future they will, you know, appreciate you being real with them. But if not, then do you really want those folks who are that delusional in your audience who will attack you if you don't say exactly what they want you to say, even if you know it's wrong? I just, I, I don't get these folks, you know, they're, they're grifters, and if really all you're doing is grifting, then sure, you only think in terms of short-sightedness and not your long-term credibility, it's just, it's embarrassing, um, you know, but this is to be expected, this is the far right in America, and um, it's not that uncommon to be this out of touch and delusional, if you are a Republican. Coke sellout and grifter Dave Rubin appeared on Newsmax TV, because of course he would appear on Newsmax TV, and he decided to give us a sneak preview and a little bit of a taste of what the next stage of his grift might entail. And um, I only speak for myself, but I am incredibly excited if he does in fact choose to pursue this route. Take a look. We're all human, John. Yes. I'm actually not quite sure he's human, but I'm only <laughs> half kidding when I say this. I'm only half kidding when I say this. I might run for governor of California. I can't take it anymore. I, I have absolutely had it with this person. And you know what? I was just discussing it with my producer. My, my platform, we're not going to have anything on a website or anything. It's literally going to be if Gavin Newsom says something or wants to do something, my platform is just the complete opposite. This guy is the worst sort of disingenuous, hypocritical buffoon that thinks that he should have power over us. I'm only half kidding when I say this. I might run for governor of California. My brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high level important ideas. Now, I think that he's only about 25 percent serious about doing this. But let me just say, Dave, if you want to run for governor of California, you have my full support. Like I wouldn't want people to vote for you, but I would want you to run because, oh my God, that would be incredibly entertaining. And he gives us a little bit of a taste of how entertaining it would be by saying, my platform, <laughs> we're not going to have anything on our website uh, or uh, or anything. It's literally going to be of Gavin Newsom. If he says something or wants to do something, my platform is just the complete opposite. Yeah, I mean, that's about what I'd expect. And it would be really, really funny to see you in a debate because you, you have no ideas. Dave Rubin is an intellectual lightweight. Like, he can't even speak to the basics of his political ideology. Like, when he was trying to explain his libertarian ideology to Joe Rogan in a now infamous interview, it was an embarrassment. Like, he hasn't been invited back on since. And it's not like Joe Rogan has really high standards as to who he'd allow on his podcast. But you proved, even to someone like Joe Rogan, that you're, you're kind of an imbecile. Like... It's not just that you're a grifter and a fraud and you don't actually believe the things that come out of your mouth, but you can't even speak to the basics. I mean, you have to be able to have some base of knowledge when it comes to the political ideology that you're espousing, but you don't even have that. Like, you can't even defend libertarians' basics, the basics of libertarianism, I should say, but it's just, it's shocking. Um, now, I will say that he has hinted 
recently about maybe quitting political commentary. Now, it's unrelated, but he basically said that if Joe Biden serves a full term, then uh, he would retire from political commentary. I'm going to make a bold statement. Michael, I'm going to make a bold statement today. Bold statement. Here we go. If Joe Biden is sworn in on January 20th, 2021, and he completes a four-year term, actually completes a four-year term, I will retire. I will retire at the end of that term. That will be it. I will disappear in just over four years, four years in about a month and a half. That'll be it. I, that's how convinced. I will just disappear from public life altogether. I will delete all of my accounts, and then you'll never hear from me again. That's how convinced I am that it ain't gonna happen. He will not be president for four years. He, just, he either won't be president at all because of the, the election fraud and all that kind of stuff, um, which by the way is gaining momentum. We're not even really covering it that much today, but it is actually gaining momentum. And Giuliani was at a hearing in Arizona today. They found some really bizarre stuff with these, mid, you know, these late night 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. vote dumps. I think in Pennsylvania, Rand Paul was tweeting about it this morning. Oops. <laughs> Now, he's not saying that, like, he will um, retire specifically from political commentary and pursue a new career path. He's saying, like, I'll, I'll retire from public life. But this is a hint that, like, quitting has been on his mind. And I think I'm looking way too far into this. But uh, basically, I want to see him run. I think this would be hilarious. He would get demolished. And I will say that, like, in terms of his intellect, I would place him probably within the same category as Louis Gohmert or Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like, I do think that low of him. My opinion of him is, like, below the floor. Um, so it would be funny. But look, I'll, I'll say this. I certainly was not envisioning Dave Rubin's grift to take this turn. You know, when I thought long-term about where his grift would take him, I always expected him to follow a pretty linear path. Like, first, he would basically become ultra-conservative. He's already kind of slipping further and further into the far right, but he would take things to the next level and he would renounce his homosexuality, divorce his husband, we'd meet his wife, Peggy. <laughs> I don't know why that name came up. <laughs> Is any woman under 50 named Peggy? I'm not sure, but we, we'd be introduced to his wife, Peggy. Um, he would become an evangelical. It kind of depends on where the conservative movement goes. Um, if it evolves out of Trump, Trumpism and whatnot, maybe he would become, an, you know, an ultra conservative individual, but we would, you know, see him take a new turn. He'd become religious. But then once he hits a brick wall there and he's tired of that, he would come out as saying, look, I actually I don't love Peggy. I love my husband. I actually am a homosexual and I feel as if I was duped by the right wing. And now this is my mea culpa. This is me apologizing to everyone who I've led astray. And I want to be authentic with myself. And then he'd go in the opposite direction where he'd read Marx and say that he is basically a communist at this point. And the grift would go in the opposite direction. And then he might even shift back to the right at some point. Basically, what he's going to do, like the way that we can predict his actions is going to be what is the most lucrative. And right now, being a right winger is truly the more lucrative path. Like if you're a right winger on YouTube, all you got to do is put out like some video about Joe Biden and the deep state and you get like hundreds of thousands of views. So he knows this. He's he's aware of this. But if it is the case that, you know, right wing um, ideology loses favor on the Internet, at least, and, you know, the right wingers lose their stronghold on YouTube... I can honestly envision a shift with Dave Rubin. It just depends. Like, I don't believe that he believes the things that he's saying. I think deep down he's probably more of a liberal, more of a moderate. I don't think he's a far-right individual, but publicly he has to be a far-right person because, I mean, let's face it, the conservative movement right now is batshit fucking insane. They're denying reality, so he has to do that too. He's just parroting whatever the right-wing thing that's popular to say is that's that's dave rubin in a nutshell but having said all of that though i really want him to run for governor i want him to run for anything because i will be all on that shit uh like um like you wouldn't believe it would be hilarious to watch him fumble and run some sort of political campaign where he is completely in over his head please make it happen dave please Dan Crenshaw is a Republican politician from the state of Texas, and he put out an ad in support of the two Republicans participating in the runoff races in Georgia, Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. 
And the ad that he released is a sequel to an ad that he released previously in this election cycle. But this one, it might be even more over the top. But when you see this, you're going to be shocked at how much of a joke it is. Like, it's so cringeworthy, it is going to make you have an out-of-body experience. I'm not going to say anything else. Just take a look. The American story is one of true exceptionalism. It's built on the greatest ideas in history. This victory tonight, it's about you. It's about defining those. Sorry, folks. I'll be right back. What do we got? Well, it's not over in Georgia. The Senate races went to a runoff. What are we up against? You'll never believe this. Far-left activists are attempting to gain full and total control of the U.S. government. That we secure a, a Democratic Senate majority so that we don't have to negotiate in that way. Should these Senate seats be lost, all will be lost. You supported the Green New Deal. You supported Medicare for all. <laughs> Your mission will be to rally support across Georgia behind these American patriots, Senator Perdue and Senator Leffler. They must win. What's our situation on the ground? We have two patriots down there, Senator Loeffler and Senator Perdue. Great fighters with a great message. They just need a little backup. Last question, who do you want to bring? Bring everyone. What's the situation at the LZ? Good evening, sir. Rather lovely form, if I may say so. But we do have a small problem at the landing zone. So-called anti-fascists, an ironic term given their propensity to, well, act like fascists, are patrolling the area. Recommend we shift north three kilometers. How does that sound? Negative. I want to say hello to the greeting party. What's the bearing? Always one for a bit of drama. 90 degrees from your current heading. Be well, sir. Man, where is this guy? Yeah, dude, it's gonna be dark soon. Where is that pirate? All right. I don't even know why I'm so angry, you know? Oh, the news told us to be. So I, <laughs> I may have made a few modifications to that ad. <laughs> I, I am a child. Um, so <laughs> I'm still not over it. <laughs> um, I, I said this on Twitter, but I'm going to say it again here because I think it's a really good point not to toot my own horn. But if you've ever been on the subreddit, I am very badass. Dan Crenshaw, or Crenshaw as I think we should call him, Basically, he's the personification of every single post on that subreddit. He just, like, has this opinion of himself that's way higher than any normal person would think of themselves. Like, he wants you to believe that he's a superhero when you're just a corrupt politician who's not very versed on specific policies. Like, if you watched his interview with Joe Rogan, him trying to explain healthcare policy, like, he's completely out of his league. And even Joe Rogan was able to, like make him look like a dunce and you're you're a policymaker you're a lawmaker so you should know these things but he couldn't even get like his own right-wing talking points in order so it's just when i see him he's not a boomer but i think boomer like he has that boomer mindset um and some boomers are great like i don't want to generalize and say that all boomers are terrible but this dude like he he has this really weird like antiquated view of himself like i'm a superhero but what's interesting is that like, in the same week he released this ad where he really wants you to think that he's a superhero, we learned that he's actually kind of a shady person. So we'll get to that and the other news surrounding him, but there's a couple things that I want to touch on regarding this ad. Um, so, quote, far-left activists are attempting to gain full and total control of the U.S. Senate. He then cuts to a picture of Chuck Schumer. 
Chuck Schumer, far left activist, not basically moderate Republican. I mean, these folks are so out of touch. You know, when you're that far to the right, everyone who is a centrist, you know, or left of center, they're going to look like radicals because you're the one who's the radical. You're the one who's too far to the right. Uh, also, you have uh, Purdue and Loeffler who are great fighters with a great message. That was a quote from the ad. What's their message? I haven't heard anything from them. Uh, the only thing that I've heard from them is that socialism bad. But what exactly are they going to do for their constituents? Like, why are they great fighters? What's their message? They don't even have a co cohesive message, just socialism bad. So that's a platitude. Also, uh, I've got a comment on the Antifa caricatures. Um, this, mo this line literally made me laugh out loud because it's so corny. Uh, I don't even know why I'm so angry. Because the news told us to be. Dan, <laughs> this is this needs to stop. You're not a super superhero, um, and if you are a superhero, then you're not like Captain America. You're kind of more like um, the super superheroes that we see from the boys. You're more like Homelander, not Captain America. Because as Ramsey Touchberry of Newsweek reports, following an independent government watchdog report that linked Representative Dan Crenshaw to a smear campaign of a female veteran, at least two Democratic lawmakers are calling for a congressional ethics probe into his alleged role. Last week's report from the Veterans Affair Inspector General said that, based on witness testimonies and documents, Crenshaw participated in an effort led by VA Secretary Robert Wilkie and some of his top deputies to disparage the reputation and credibility of a woman who said she was sexually assaulted last year at a VA facility. The IG report said no criminal evidence was found, but that some of its investigation could not be completed, in part because Crenshaw and others refused to cooperate. However, it said that attempts by Wilkie, top VA officials, and Crenshaw to erode the female veteran's credibility by creating a narrative that she has made false sexual assault claims in the past were unprofessional and disparaging. Crenshaw, a former Navy SEAL, served with the woman, Andrea Goldstein. Last month, Crenshaw vehemently denied to Newsweek that he ever discussed Goldstein with Wilkie, but an internal email from Wilkie to top VA officials suggested otherwise, with the secretary himself claiming that Crenshaw approached him at an event to discuss Goldstein and her allegations. Top department officials also told the IG that Wilkie had indicated Crenshaw passed along information about Goldstein. So you're no hero, my dude. You're a shitty person. Person. You're Homelander. Because you, someone who is supposed to look out for the troops since you're a veteran yourself, you're smearing someone. You're smearing a woman because she came forward with sexual assault allegations. Like, that makes you one of the shittiest people imaginable, like one of the worst members of Congress. That's disgusting, and you can deny it all you want, but there's evidence to prove that you were involved in this. Now, nobody's alleging that there's criminal activity here, but this just speaks to your character. You want everyone to think of you as a hero, but you are a terrible person. Smearing a female veteran who came forward with sexual assault. Like, this is an issue. And you should be compassionate because this is a fellow member of the military. You, you served with her, you knew her, but yet you're smearing her. Like, this is disgusting. This is absolutely grotesque. So I don't want you to, you know, uh, think of Dan Crenshaw in the way that he wants you to think of him as this badass hero who is super cool because he goes skydiving. No, dude, you look like, you know, a dad who's going through a midlife crisis who cheats on his wife. But in actuality, you're not very cool. You're a piece of shit. You're a smear merchant and you're a bad person. Like, that's, I don't know what else to say about it. Dan Crenshaw is a shitty person and um, he's also extremely cringeworthy and his opinion of himself is way, way too high. So I feel like I'm the last person who's finding out about this, but apparently Barack Obama, former president, is working with Netflix to produce his own sketch comedy show. Why? I have no idea, but I am really hoping that it tanks and nobody watches it. And apparently Fox News agrees with me. Yeah, I hate it when somebody who's a terrible person or a terrible network makes a good point, but they're kind of right. They don't like this, and it's not necessarily because... They, you know, um, they think that Obama is unfunny because I think he probably would be, but because they just have to basically 
carry on this notion that Obama is bad no matter what. Anyways, uh, to talk about this is an expert on the subject of comedy. So Fox News brought on comedian Jeff Dunham, and he explained why this was a bad idea, but the interview itself didn't really touch on Obama. Instead, Jeff Dunham ended up talking about cancel culture, and what really struck me was the way that the Fox host fake laughed throughout this whole thing, and her fake laugh made me cry laugh. Like, I kid you not. I've watched this so many times by now, but now I want to share it with you. So somehow that very unfunny man now has his own sketch comedy show on Netflix. That's right. The former president and first lady are producing a show called The G Word, which is expected to be loosely based on an anti-Trump book about the supposed chaos during the transition in 2016. It's not only the comedy series no one in America is not asking for, it's also just more competition for my next guest, who is joining me now, Jeff Dunham, whose new comedy special, completely unrehearsed, last-minute pandemic holiday special, premiered tonight on Comedy Central. Congrats about that. So, Thanks, Lisa. So, Jeff, this is really something that, you know, we need more of, which is anti-Trump bias. There's, there's not enough of that right now. Yeah, it, Walter. Uh, Lisa, did you, you didn't introduce me to this time, and thanks for having me on your show. I got a question for you before we get into the old Obama thing. So sitting in for Laura uh, over Thanksgiving, is this like a career move or did you lose a bet? <laughs> well, I would say career move, but I, you know, I'm sure the people who hate me would say other things. Uh, so, yeah, you know, as for, as for the Obama sketch uh, comedy show, I, I just, I honestly don't understand it. There's the dignity of the office. There's the 72 million people, uh, you know, that voted the other way. Uh, this year, so I, I, it really bewilders me. But did you know, Lisa? Did you know this that Obama actually wanted to be our opening act in our Comedy Central special this time? Did you know that? Why? Well, I hope he said no because he's not very funny. Well, but we didn't say no. The Secret Service said no because they wouldn't let Jeff stuff him in the suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that would probably raise some alarms, I would assume, among the Secret Service. But so here, I mean, look, why the com comedians have barely touched Joe Biden. Like, I can give you plenty of material. He sat around with kids around him talking about a guy named Corn Pop. He talked about when he was a lifeguard at the pool, kids touched his hairy legs. I mean, right there, target rich environment. Why have comedians not, they've barely touched it. I, you know, it's it's that, that the cancel culture, because it's it's amazing how comics now, uh, I used to say that, that stand-up comedy was the last form of free speech. It's not anymore, because you know how it is. Everybody has a voice now. Everybody's on social media. There used to be the sanctity of the comedy club or the sanctity of, uh, you know, the, the live show. Uh, but now, um, and I used to say, if you were offending 5% of the audience, it was a good it was a good number, because the 5% that were ticked off, whatever they were mad at, the other 95% were laughing at. But now, unfortunately, that 5% can end your career with a couple of tweets. So it's it's becoming really difficult now. But so why do you think we've arrived at this moment, though? I mean, you're, you're talking about some of the cancel culture we see. We literally see people go through, you know, social media accounts like five years ago, right, and try to destroy someone's career. So why, why have we arrived at this point? Well, I, I, again, I think it's the social media. I think that uh, everybody has a voice now. and everybody there, It didn't used to be that way. You didn't hear from Joe Schmo, But now Joe Schmo can say whatever he wants. He can hide in his basement, hide behind his... Uh, uh, his computer screen and his keyboard and just say what he wants. And so, like tonight, my premiere, uh, uh, my special premiered, and I was talking to the people that look at this stuff for me, and I said, how are the numbers? How is it, you know, how is, uh, what are the reactions? Reactions are good. And then what percentage of haters do we have? Well, there, <laughs> because... there's, there's always haters. <laughs> right. But I, I do, I, I, I don't know the answer to this. And for the people that tend to uh, lean a little bit right, uh, yeah, there's no room for you. Um, it is amazing how it's just like voting. It's the same thing. If you leaned a little bit right and we're going to vote uh, for Trump, you didn't dare tell anyone. It's the same with comics right. uh, or anybody in show business right now. Um, or many businesses. And, and you Jeff, can't say. I, I want to make you sure. You can't say if you're leaning right. So tell me a little bit about your special and why people should tune in. Well, uh, this was really was a last minute special. I've been sitting around for, for months and I thought I got to do something. Here's when I knew I had to do something. I was in the kitchen with my five-year-old twin boys and my wife. I picked up a chip clip to make it talk. My boys were on the floor laughing. They thought it was a comedic genius. I thought I got to get out of this house. 
So we threw this special together and uh, some really good writers. We put it all together. We put it on stage. I only thought it up two months ago. We shot it three weeks ago and now it's on the air. Uh, it's aired a couple times already on your coast and it's going to air in just a few minutes at eight o'clock our time here on the West Coast. But I, I did it because I feel people need laughs and there's no politics in this special whatsoever. Uh, so I've changed that up a little bit. It's for the whole family. And I, I just think it's go goofy, stupid fun. Yeah, I, like your show. No. Well, Jeff and Walter, I can't forget uh, you little guy, or I guess old, old guy. You look, uh, you know, I mean, you look kind of okay. young, but you know. So I think that the reason why this segment really resonated with me is because like what Jeff Dunham said, it wasn't funny at all. And if you found it funny, it certainly wasn't funny enough to warrant that level of laughter. So sitting in for Laura uh, over Thanksgiving, is this like a career move or did you lose a bet? <laughs> I've gotten already like way too much mileage out of this segment. <laughs> but um apparently uh Jeff Dunham has some thoughts about cancel culture, like a lot of comedians nowadays. Uh but here's the thing. She asked them about Obama and Obama's comedy show and specifically why it doesn't seem as if Joe Biden, who is kind of a target-rich environment, is kind of like untouchable for a lot of comedians. And to that, I would say uh, he is made fun of all the time. In fact, some of the memes that I've seen on the internet, at least, I don't know about comedians, but the memes that I've seen have been the funniest of this entire political cycle. So he is someone who is made fun of a lot, and I hope that that continues because, of course, as president... Sure, he's going to have a lot of fuck-ups, he's going to make a lot of gaffes, and I hope that people capitalize on that. Having said that, though, this was Jeff Dunham's response, and yes, I actually took the time to transcribe what he said. You know, it's it's that, that cancel culture, because it's amazing how comics now, I used to say that stand-up comedy was the last form of free speech. That's stupid. It's not anymore, because you know how it is. Everybody has a voice now. Everybody is on social media. There used to be the sanctity of the comedy club, okay? The sanctity of the live show. But now, and I used to say, if you were offended, uh, if you offended 5% of the audience, it was a good night because the 5% that were ticked off, whatever they were mad at, the other 95% were laughing. But now, that 5% can end your career with a couple of tweets. So it's becoming really difficult now. So um, that was a really wild ride that he took us on. But I think the point that he's trying to make is that since now people have smartphones, like what you say at the comedy club doesn't just stay in the comedy club. Like they can film you. So if you say something racist, as I'm assuming he has in the past, uh, then they could put it on Twitter and that could end your career. But he's speaking as if he knows from experience what it's like to be canceled when you're on Fox News. You're there talking about your new comedy special on Netflix. So have you been canceled? I mean, at some point in time, I'm sure that somebody has tweeted that they were offended by Jeff Dunham, but join the club, buddy. I'm not a comedian. And I've been tweeted that I'm canceled. Not like that specifically, but I've been told that I've made offensive comments that were offensive to one person and another person. And I've criticized this politician too much. Like our thoughts and views are subjective. And yes, everybody does have a voice now, but you're not canceled. You're on television. So what's the problem? What's the point that you're trying to make? What if it's the case that people aren't watching you because you're not funny? What if that's what it is? What if it's not cancel culture? And what if you just don't produce good content? And I love how he speaks up as if he's this like bold truth teller and this renegade who's speaking out against ca cancel culture. But then he says this, there's no politics in this special whatsoever. Okay, <laughs> so so if you're not if you're not going to talk about politics, then I mean theoretically, there's no fear that you're going to be canceled. So what the problem is, and I just want to remind you that this basically was supposed to be a segment where they attack Obama because that really is genuinely offensive to me. Like I want to cancel Obama's Netflix show. I think that's stupid. Like stop worshiping Obama for the love of God, people. So that's stupid. So sure, if they want to shit on Obama, that's fine. But in terms of like who's more funnier, if I had to guess between Jeff Dunham and Barack Obama, that's actually tough because what I saw there, and I've never seen a Jeff Dunham, you know, stand up special, so maybe it's different. What I saw there was awful. Um, and I think anyone could possibly be more funny than Jeff Dunham. And I'm not saying that like the the puppet thing is stupid. I think that 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 could be funny. It could work, but your jokes are not funny. What I saw there was stupid and cringeworthy. Uh, it was 
boomer humor. And if that's what you're presenting, then cancel culture isn't what you have to worry about. You just need better material because your shit's stupid, my dude. Your shit is stupid. So do better. Um, having said that, though, I do agree with the overall sentiment that Obama should not have a comedy show on Netflix because that is just stupid. And the only reason why he got that isn't because he's funny. It's because he's Obama. So, yeah, all around, um, weird. <laughs> Jeff Dunham on Fox News. Serious News Network, folks. Serious News Network. Every once in a while, Fox News will run out of things to talk about. So what they'll do is they will go fishing for content by looking for reasons to be outraged. And one of the areas where they often find what they're looking for is AOC's Instagram feed. Uh, this time, there's a video of her cooking where she's casually discussing politics. And they did not like what she had to say. But I really like this clip and where they talk about AOC because they ended up making fools of themselves when they accidentally made a left-wing point in responding to AOC. This was great. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez takes to Instagram, yeah, to cook lemon pasta with salmon for followers and then using the platform to respond to critics that call her radical. Take a look. You know, shout out to my fellow radicals who think that, you know, we should live in a humane, advanced society. Um, and that we shouldn't be under the thumb of a $7 minimum wage and, you know, racist systems because, I don't know, because that just benefits whoever the people are in power to already be in power. So, you know, shout out to my radicals. Now, this morning, she posted a video on Twitter highlighting which parts of her first term radical agenda she was able to achieve. Take a look. I authored and introduced the Green New Deal with Senator Ed Markey and secured 115 House and Senate co-sponsors on it. Regional versions of the Green New Deal were also adopted by 10 local governments, including the state of New Mexico and cities of Austin, Los Angeles, New York City, Boston, and more. We unveiled the Green New Deal for public housing, which would invest up to $180 billion over 10 years. We got President Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, to state on the record that uh, President Trump was engaging in tax fraud and to name other potential witnesses. Witnesses. On the presidential campaign, I co-chaired the Climate Unity Task Force with Secretary Kerry to help shape President-elect Biden's $2 trillion climate policy. Meanwhile, yesterday, she knocked Biden's agenda, saying it, quote, had, oh, it's a little hazy, citing a lack of a cohesive vision uh, across his ca uh, cabinet. Here with the reaction. Fox News contributors Jason Chaffetz and Tammy Bruce, Bruce are with us. Well, you know, looking at the court decision tonight, Tammy, and understanding its likely ramifications in a lot of ways, uh, one has to wonder, is America really ready for what is about to hit them if this now becomes the law of the land? Well, look, I think that, first of all, calling Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a, a, a radical is an insult to actual radicals. This nation is the radical idea. Our constitution is radical. The last radicals we saw were in the mid 1700s, our founders. Radicalism is coming up with something completely new that sets people free. She is not a radical. She is someone who is spewing platitudes for a failed idea, for a failed system to, well, effectively trick people into thinking she represents something. It is an ignorant point of view. You can ask the people of Venezuela about her kind of radicalism. Uh, there is nothing radical about the failed communist states uh, that have destroyed people's lives. She has been misled. Her cohorts have been misled. And Americans want a future they can count on. That is what is in front of the Supreme Court right now. Not that young woman cooking some salmon over Instagram. Well, she said Venezuela, so case closed. All you have to do in response to a socialist is say Venezuela. And it's like a magical spell. It like shuts them down and capitalism automatically wins. It's like the most persuasive argument you can use as a capitalist. Vuvuzela. <laughs> they have to come up with better material. I don't think that they've realized that Venezuela, like, Saying that in response to someone who's making a somewhat socialist argument, it's a meme at this point. You have to find new material. Um, but I just got a comment before we get to Tammy Bruce. Sean Hannity, like you can actually hear 
the disgust in his voice when he's talking about what she's making. Like, she's making lemon pasta with salmon. Like, you can tell he wants to be doing something better. Like, he wants something more intellectually stimulating. And Fox News usually does this. Like, they'll, they'll clip out a portion of AOC saying something and they'll bring on a guest to attack her because they don't have anything else to talk about. And you could tell that, like, he's bored with this. Like, he's not as outraged as he's leading on. Having said that, though, I will say that the feelings that he expressed when talking about lemon pasta with salmon, I kind of felt that way as well because I'm, that doesn't sound great to me. Uh, but having said that, we have to get to what Tammy Bruce said. Her point here is stunning. Calling AOC a radical is an insult to actual radicals. So she makes the point that AOC in actuality isn't a radical. All right, let's hear her out. This nation is a radical idea. Our constitution is radical. AOC is not a radical. Interesting. So you concede to the point then that it's not actually radical to think that the government shouldn't let its citizens die if they don't have health care, that we should be guaranteed an education. Like you don't think that these things are radical because that's what she believes in. So if you're saying she's not a radical, you're making our point for us that it's not radical to think that human beings deserve these basic things. And she's actually right about this. It isn't radical to think that healthcare should be a right. Because these are things that aren't controversial even to conservatives in other countries. So if you look at the UK, the Tories don't think that guaranteed healthcare is radical. Sure, they want to chip away at it and privatize more and more of it. But the basic idea that healthcare is a right, that's not radical. It's not controversial. Conservatives in Canada, they believe that healthcare should be a right. It's not radical. It's only radical here because the political spectrum is so far to the right that as a far right winger in the United States, like looking to someone who's saying that healthcare should be free at the point of service, that sounds radical to you because of your perspective. But in actuality, it's really not radical. Like it's not radical to think that the government should provide us with basic things. You believe that as well. Otherwise, you think that we shouldn't have roads that we drive on. We shouldn't have a military, right? Because this is the social contract. Like, we give the government our money, our tax dollars, and in turn, there's this expectation that we get services in exchange for that money in return, right? Our government is supposed to protect us. That's why we have a military. We will be secure physically in our homes. We don't have to worry about foreign invaders, right? Now, our government's military takes it a little bit extreme because we are an empire, but in general, the basic idea is we give government money in exchange for for services, protect us from invaders, make sure that we have clean drinking water and breathable air. So why, why can't we demand healthcare? The basic expectation, what is minimally required of government is to take care of their citizens, make sure that they don't die. And in this country, thousands of Americans die every single year because they don't have health care. And we're not talking about access to affordable health care. I'm talking about health care, period. This is only controversial here because we live in a late stage capitalist society. So I really appreciate Tammy Bruce making this point because she's right. AOC is not a radical. It's not a radical idea to think that we deserve to survive as human beings, that we should have food to eat, water to drink, and health care. Now, I love another point that she made because it, it's so... It's so ironic that I don't even know how to respond to it. Uh, AOC isn't a radical, but she is someone who's spewing platitudes for a failed idea. You're the one who's spewing platitudes. Like, what is it that right-wingers believe? I have no idea. I know that they don't like socialism, and I know that they think Venezuela bad, but what do you believe? Like, what policies would you implement? Would you just leave, leave things as is? I mean, the planet is dying. We have people, you know, facing an eviction crisis. So, of course, you have to believe that some action, even if it's just the bare minimum, should be taken. So, what's your belief? Freedom. Liberty. I mean, the right wing uh, in America, they are nothing but platitudes. They don't believe in anything. They just have a commitment to this vague idea of freedom. But for whatever reason, that doesn't extend to freedom to like be alive and not die if you don't have health care. It's amazing to me. Uh, last thing that I want to touch on that she said is um, basically she ended up contradicting herself and midpoint she realized it and she ended up just confusing herself. So she says, you can ask the people of Venezuela 
about her kind of radicalism. So she's thinking, fuck, I just said she's not a radical, and now I'm saying she is a radical. But then she says, um, after saying that you can ask the people of Venezuela about her kind of radicalism, uh, there's nothing radical about the failed communist states that have destroyed people's lives. Stop for a moment and think about that sentence. Let's, let's read it again. You can ask the people of Venezuela about her kind of radicalism. There's nothing radical about the failed communist states that have destroyed people's lives. So you're saying that communism isn't radical? Like if Tammy Bruce were a Pokemon, she would have hurt herself in her confusion. And yes, that is my first millennial dad joke. <laughs> so she she is a radical, but she also isn't a radical. And communist regimes that destroy people's lives aren't radical. Tammy, let's workshop this a little bit more. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, she really, she was trying to make a point about how AOC, you know, she she's just trotting out the same tired thing that we've heard. But in actuality, the point that you've made is our point for us. So thank you so much. Because yeah, AOC is not radical. It's not radical to ask that the government use our tax dollars and actually help us rather than bombing other countries abroad. That's not radical. So I agree with you, Tammy. Thank you. Carry on. I've been trying to go out of my way to share stories from nurses and doctors working on the front lines fighting COVID-19 because I think that if we're not there, if we don't know anyone who shares this experience, it's really easy for us as individuals to become complacent, right? Like we see the numbers tick up and that's terrifying. But when numbers get so big, it's easy for us to kind of like tune out. It's much more easier to conceptualize the pain of one individual. But when we think about hundreds of thousands of people dying from a virus, that's a lot more difficult to imagine because it, it's such a large scale. So I try to share stories from nurses and, and doctors so that way we kind of get a sense of what they're going through so we continue to take this seriously. And I want to share three videos from three different nurses and doctors. What they say here is truly gut-wrenching. So the first is from, is from a nurse in Minnesota. And she is taking care of COVID-19 patients. She's been on the front lines. And she's asked how she's doing in an interview on CNN. And she immediately breaks down. It's bad. This is tough to watch. But take a look at what she has to say. I want to bring in Dr. Shirley Z, Associate Director of Hospital Medicine for Hennepin Healthcare. And Doctor, thanks for being with us. I know your hospital is in downtown Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, currently dealing with a recent spike in the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19. What has been the hardest part of your job this week? Um, I think it is just the feeling of just suffocating all the time you know we're we're suffocating in our patients isolation and their fear um it's suffocating in just the emotional and physical exhaustion of all of our colleagues it's it's feeling helpless because there's often nothing we can do for people um and i think it's it's the constant thought of what's coming next um 9,000 Minnesotans were um, diagnosed with coronavirus on Sunday, and then another 9,000 on Monday. And every single day, thousands more people are getting this virus. And we know that means that in a few days, in a week, hundreds of people are needing to come into the hospital, and, and hundreds of people are going to die. And I, I think that sometimes when you hear statistics like that, you um, become numb to what those numbers mean. But but for us, you know, the people that are taking care of these patients, every single number is somebody that we have to look at and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing more I can do for you. And it's just another family we have to call to tell them that their loved ones are going to die. My, my heart breaks for everybody who has lost their jobs for their housing and for kids that are able to go to school and for people that can't see their families. Um, but I, I don't think that people can really comprehend how horrific this disease is unless they've been personally touched by it. I mean, people are literally suffocating. 
inside our hospitals and they are dying alone. Um, and they don't get the luxury to complain about COVID fatigue and their families don't get the luxury to complain about it because they're living in like COVID hell. Um, we all want to be able to have our lives go back to normal, but it doesn't mean that we can't can pretend that this doesn't actually exist. And I think that's the problem is that, you know, no one wants to believe how horrible it is. And so they've just given up. I don't know what to even say. This interview was filmed on December uh, 5th, and it's gotten a lot worse since then. So you could only imagine what it's like now. Hospitals are filling up. They're reaching maximum, maximum capacity in certain states. And what she describes, it's, it's horrific. People are literally suffocating inside our hospitals and people are dying alone. And she says something that I think is accurate. Nobody wants to believe how horrible it is, so they're just giving up. But they don't get to give up if you're working on the front lines. Like, you have no choice. This is your job. And even if you wanted to quit, I feel like you're there and you have that knowledge. So there, there'd be this sense of obligation. But what we've got to come to terms with as a society is that this is going to affect healthcare workers for decades to come. For the rest of their lives, probably. Like, they're going to suffer from PTSD forever because of the things that they're seeing. Now, another nurse from Oklahoma, she's taking care of COVID-19 patients, but it's affected her in a more personal way because she lost both her mother and her husband from COVID-19 within three days. And while her husband and mother were dying from it, the only remaining family member that she had who could have comforted her would have been her son, and he had COVID-19. So she couldn't see him because she had to be healthy to take care of COVID-19 patients. Like her story here, it's just, it's so overwhelming. And the situation that she describes here, it's, it's unbearable. It sounds so awful. How are you doing? You know, I think it's just so raw. You know, sometimes I'm grieving for my husband and then I realize my mom's gone, you know, and then I'm grieving for my mom and I just think, oh, I'm going to go tell Dennis and then Dennis is gone. And so the two people that would have been so supportive had the other one gone, you know, they're both gone. And I just, it's my son and I and my older son. I feel like we're both drowning, but as we go down, we're trying to push the other one back up to take a breath. And it, it didn't have to be this way. It, it just didn't have to be this way. We, our family didn't have to be gutted, you know? We just, everybody talks about it. it's 0 0.1 whatever percent, what's well, 40% of my family that's gone, so. Yeah. Now, things like this are difficult to hear, but I really feel like it's important that we don't look away and we force ourselves to acknowledge what's happening. You know, try not to be ignorant, try to appreciate what these nurses and doctors are doing something that a lot of us don't have the courage or willpower to do i know i couldn't do that like it takes someone of a certain i don't know i don't even know what to say like willpower and strength to be able to do what they're doing to put up with what they're putting up with it's just it's awful now the final video is from the uh nurse from this viral photo he kind of explains what happened Again, really, really troubling uh, to hear this. What he says hits close to home for me in particular, and I'll explain why. As I'm going inside my COVID unit, I see that this elderly patient is out of his bed and trying to get out of the, of the room, and he's crying. So I get close to him, and I tell him, why are you crying? And, and the man says, I want to be with my wife. So, you know, I just grab him. I, I, I hold him. I did not know that uh, I was... Uh, being photographed at the time uh, and you know he was just crying and eventually he he got he, he felt better and he stopped crying so I mean when I see this when I see what they're saying I've kind of always had this expectation that nurses and doctors at some point probably become desensitized because you see so much pain and suffering that there has to be some like mechanism psychologically that you use to tune out because if you truly like, I don't know, internalized all of the suffering that you saw on a daily basis. Like, it, it would wreck you as a human being. But this shows you that these folks, they they haven't lost 
their empathy for human beings. So my expectation of nurses and doctors has kind of been shattered because I, I kind of, I think, conveniently put it out of my mind what they're going through and think, well, you know, by now they're desensitized. So it's probably not as bad for them as we would expect it as someone who's not dealing with that. But no, it, it really is bad. And the reason why this hits close to home for me is because like I lost my dad this year. And to think that, you know, if he was in this situation where he got COVID and where he died alone, I think of how much worse an already painful situation would have been. And the long-term care facility that my dad it was staying at before he died, there's a massive outbreak of COVID-19 there. And I'm thinking through like all of the patients who I saw and interacted with when I would go to visit my dad and who were so friendly and they're suffering right now. And if they're sick, how sick are they? Are they able to see their loved ones? And I know the answer is no. And it's so much devastation that like these videos, it really, it hit close to home. I just, you know, I want to be optimistic and think that we see the light at the end of the tunnel. The vaccine is on its way. The Calvary has arrived. But at the same time, it's a really long road ahead. Um, so I, I share this not because I want to make you depressed, even though it is undoubtedly depressing, but I think it really, really is important that we force ourselves to not look away if we're able to. Because I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to just like put this out of my mind and, you know, think they've got this. Like these are human beings who are seeing so much suffering and there's a lot of people suffering right now. And it's just like, I, I can't, I can't be ignorant. I feel like I'm obligated to shed light on their experiences. So people are maybe a little bit more inclined to take it seriously. And we don't know how much worse this virus is going to get. We're seeing hospitals reach capacity and, you know, makeshift morgues being built in California. You know, even if COVID-19 is no longer a pandemic, sometime in 2021 we'll be dealing with this like the long time repercussions psychologically and economically for years possibly decades to come we are going to watch a clip from cnbc that is depressing to me because it really demonstrates that we are living in that dystopian late stage capitalist society that we always feared but it's here now and this clip is two individuals on the network reacting to news that any normal person should be repulsed by. So it's news that during this pandemic, billionaires have substantially grown their wealth. They've increased their wealth collectively by half a trillion dollars while millions of Americans face eviction. So they're going to explain why this actually isn't bad news. To the contrary, it's good news. And not only that, billionaires getting richer during a pandemic is inspirational they literally made this point their year for ipos is turning into a banner year for newly minted american billionaires robert frank joins us now with more um i'm celebrating robert i'm not one of them but i'm just on the record i'm not bernie sanders i'm i'm celebrating i'm celebrating that there's taxes there's philanthropy there's the possibility it can happen to other people if you work hard and have a great idea. I like millionaires and I like billionaires, but uh, you go ahead. I'm not going to comment on this. I have, I have no editorial opinion. Yeah, yeah th these stories are just really inspirational, no matter what your point of view. You've got this week two IPOs, six billionaires, over $40 billion in personal wealth. You look at DoorDash, they minted three new multi-billionaires this week. CEO Tony Shu, he's now worth over $2.7 billion. You've got co-founders Andy Fang and Stanley Tang. They were all friends at Stanford, and they did the first coding and food delivering while working at night while they were students at school. Those two guys worth $2.5 billion. Now, the winner of the week was Brian Chesky. He, of course, Airbnb CEO. And he's one of three co-founders who started the company when they were flat broke, sitting in a San Francisco apartment, they decided to rent out air mattresses to make the rent. Chesky, now worth over $11 billion. He also got a share grant this fall, valued at $1.8 billion, so that's on top of that. And he and the other guys cashed out about $90 million in stock yesterday. Now, co-founders... 
Joe Gebbia and Nathan Blacharczyk, they are now worth over $10 billion, also cashing out some of those shares. Now, in total, American billionaires have gained a trillion dollars in wealth just this year. I think about Amazon, too, and I, you know, people complain, no taxes, all that kind of stuff. Think of the, the jobs. Think of the, the, the taxes paid by all the employees of Amazon. Amazon. Think about the, the uh, people that own the stock and what that's done for, for their retirement and for wealth creation and for uh, asset values. Think of all those things. Would you really want to get whatever it, it, they would pay per year? Is that really so important that you, or, you know, or, that, that, that you Yeah, or you're like Elon Musk. Elon Musk, who's about a tenth of that trillion this year. He's over $110 billion in wealth added just this year. And, and he's told California, which, right. you know, he believes has gone excessive regulation, excessive taxes. Forget it. I'm in Texas. So now the, the three richest people in the world do not pay state income taxes. And I right. think that's a signal. Well, that was great the other day when we, when we had that discussion about New York. I love the guy. I love the guy. He, he, he really wants to tax rich people except for the salt. Because <laughs> if you don't do the salt, they're going to move. So you do like rich people if they stay. You just don't like I mean, I could not understand. Right. Do you understand that logic at all? I don't understand that we, logic. We like Democratic rich people. We don't like Republican wealthy people. I think that was the message that the Democrats Maybe that was saying. it. Well, we, can't we all just get along? Uh, anyway, all right, yes. Robert. Oh, I can assure you, we don't like rich people who are Democrats as well. We don't like all of them. And when we say eat the rich, we're not saying eat the right wing rich. We're talking about eating all of them. So um, my response overall to that, if I could summarize it, is uh, this. You were supposed to lick the boot, not deep throat it. And the reason why, you know, that guest on the program, why his mouth was so dry and why you heard this is because when they cut away to B-roll, he was actually continuing to lick the boots of billionaires. Got him. <laughs> I mean, this honestly left me speechless. I saw this and I thought, this is indistinguishable from satire. Like, if you told me this was a skit on SNL, I would believe it. It's that bad. Now, I know that CNBC, I'm not their target audience, right? The demographic is wealthy people, I, I guess. Uh, but what they said here is ridiculous. So, uh, I like millionaires and billionaires. But why? Why do you like millionaires and billionaires? Why do you worship them? Why does just having a lot of money make them worthy of your praise? Why? What's the point? And the only thing that I could say is that it's it's delusions, right? I like millionaires and billionaires because I believe that maybe one day I could be part of that club. But that's that's not the case. You're not going to be a millionaire. You're not going to be a billionaire. I mean, maybe these folks on CNBC will, but the average person, you have a greater statistical likelihood of getting struck by lightning or getting eaten by a shark than becoming a billionaire. So the American dream is dead. So what reason do you have to like millionaires and billionaires other than just being a fucking sycophant? I don't know. They also say these stories are just really inspirational. No matter what your point of view, six billionaires over 40 million in personal wealth how is this inspirational? What normal person reacts to this story of billionaires growing their wealth exponentially during a pandemic and thinks, oh, well, this is so inspirational. This just proves that, like, anyone can make it. They're billionaires. And sure, some people break through the ranks and they end up getting wealthy. They, making, uh, they end up making a name for themselves. But that is very, very statistically unlikely and having more than a billion dollars in personal wealth that isn't a thing that happens unless you exploited your workers jeff bezos couldn't be a billionaire if he actually paid his workers well treated his workers appropriately but that's not the case Thousands of Amazon warehouse workers are overworked to the point where they're pissing in bottles, they're contracting COVID-19, they're not paid a living wage. And there's a reason why Jeff Bezos has the money that he has. There's a reason why he's the richest person in the world, specifically because he exploited the labor of, of his employees. Also, they say people complain about Amazon and taxes paid. Think of the jobs. Think of all of the taxes paid by employees of Amazon. So he says this, he doesn't realize how infuriating it is that 
he's applauding Amazon workers paying taxes, but not the actual company itself. Why is it better that people who can't afford it as much are paying, but the company who makes billions of dollars in profit, in fact, I believe that Amazon is now a trillion dollar company, that's not like something that would be better. I just, I don't get the thinking. I don't get the thinking. These people are fucking idiots. Like, I'm trying to like present you with commentary here that's reasonable and, and uh, like I'm trying to be nuanced here, but I don't think there's anything else to uh, say about this. These are idiots. These are sycophants. These are bootlickers. They're saying what the establishment wants them to say. But if you truly like millionaires and billionaires in the way that you say that you do, then understand that if they keep hoarding wealth, especially when people are suffering, when millions are going hungry, on unemployment, facing an, evic an eviction crisis, then when the pitchforks come out, you'll learn that your precious billionaires would have been better off if they didn't be so fucking openly greedy. Because that's the thing. It's like they're flaunting their wealth. How, mon how many billions of dollars did Elon Musk make in 2020 alone during a pandemic? Yeah, so this, honestly, this segment, uh, it it made me rage. And uh, I think that any reasonable person will see this and be disgusted by it because this is only something that a late-stage capitalist dystopian society could produce. I always find it fascinating when CEOs and multimillionaires, they speak up about how bad socialism is and they just can't understand or even fathom why anyone would see the appeal of socialism when our capitalist society has been so phenomenal to them. Like they're in that bubble and they're incapable of getting outside of it. So the Whole Foods CEO decided to speak up and condemn socialism and he wants to make sure that we kind of put a cap on this growing enthusiasm for socialism before it's too late. So the New York Post's Noah Manskar reports, Whole Foods CEO John Mackey urged his fellow corporate leaders to join him in beating back the rising tide of socialism, an ideology he fears will plunge the world into poverty. That's ironic. In a recent interview with the conservative American Enterprise Institute, Mackey said business bosses need to more aggressively push back against progressives increasing popular critiques of capitalism, a system he called the greatest thing that humanity's ever created. Interesting. Asked whether the business world's culture needs to change, the grocery tycoon replied, it needs to evolve, otherwise the socialists are going to take over. That's how I see it, and that's the path of poverty. They talk about trickle-down wealth, but socialism is trickle-up poverty, he said. It just impoverishes everything. We've told a bad narrative, and we've let the enemies of business and the enemies of capitalism put out a narrative about us that's wrong. It's inaccurate and it's doing tremendous damage to the minds of young people, Mackey added. We have to counter that. The 67-year-old Whole Foods co-founder made the remark while promoting his latest book, Conscious Leadership. During a November 24th virtual event with the American Enterprise Institute, a right-leaning think tank that supports free market policies, Mackey, who was worth more than $75 million when Amazon announced its purchase of Whole Foods in 2017, according to Forbes, complained that entrepreneurs have been universally vilified as greedy when many of them start businesses is mostly because they're passionate about something, not just to get rich. Okay. Now, embedded in his statements, you can tell that there's a sense, a slight sense of self-awareness. He realizes that what they're doing right now is turning people off to capitalism. And it is. Like, you're being openly greedy, and we see it, and you want to maybe try to be better in terms of marketing capitalism because, you know, it's just kind of been the norm for so long and questioning capitalism has been blasphemous that you could really basically be openly greedy and that's celebrated almost. But now things are changing because a late stage capitalist society can only exist so long before it eats itself and the poor get so hungry that they have nothing left to eat but the rich. I think he realizes that. But what's interesting is that he's concerned trolling about how socialism will lead to mass poverty. But I mean, look around you. Look at what's happening in our capitalist system. 14 million American households could face eviction. Cars lined up for miles and waited for hours just to receive a box of food on Thanksgiving. We're reaching record high levels of unemployment and just 100 corporations are responsible for most of the Earth's greenhouse gas emissions. Socialism didn't do this. Capitalism did this. We're literally destroying the only planet that we have 
For what? So a handful of oligarchs can have unlimited wealth? That's ridiculous. People hate capitalism because it has failed. The promises of capitalism have not bared out. 59 Americans own more wealth than a half of the country. So now the American dream is dead. Capitalism got so big that it's literally eating itself. Six media conglomerates own most news outlets. 13 companies own most fast food restaurants. I mean, the promise of competition is completely dead, and capitalism isn't breeding the innovation that we promised it would. There's literally a love story about fucking KFC and Colonel Sanders. Capitalism has been a complete and utter failure. And honestly, I think that he's kind of onto something. If oligarchs gave the peasants more than just crumbs, there wouldn't be this much of an urgency to get rid of capitalism. But because capitalism has deprived millions of people and billions globally of basic necessities that human beings deserve and have a right to, well, now you see that it's unsustainable. People know that we can't continue on this trajectory of unfettered capitalism. So even if they tried to rein it in, I think it's it's too late. Like even if you give us social democracy, it's too late. Like people see that capitalism is a scam. It's a huge scam. It benefits a select few group of individuals. And sure, at first, capitalism, it works out fine. But over time, capitalism does what it always will do eat the political system that it's born in. And what this Whole Foods CEO doesn't realize is that once people no longer have a say in democracy, then it's too late. You can't win us back under these circumstances. So it's just, it's hilarious because we have this multimillionaire who has benefited from capitalism. He's wondering, oh my God, why do people hate capitalism? I don't know. It seems like you know that we hate capitalism and you know that capitalism, you know, it's it's clearly a bad look. But what he is basically uh, thinking, I suspect, is that capitalism just needs like a better marketing scheme, you know, a new PR firm to do its uh, presentations for it. But that's not it. That's not it. If you don't give people tangibles... Capitalism isn't going to last because they will take down the system. It might not happen now. It might not happen decades from now or 100 years from now. But it is inevitable because our current trajectory that we are on, that our late stage capitalist society is on, is unsustainable. We live in a late stage capitalist society, so we already know that, you know, it's, it's unsurprising when we see stories about the rich getting richer during a pandemic. It's unsurprising to see that large multinational corporations are making record profits during a pandemic as they lay off thousands of workers. But a new report by the Washington Post really gives us a sense of the scale of this issue and how disgusting the greed of corporate America is. And it's truly it's shocking, like it's worse than I thought. Now, I'm going to link you to the article from the Washington Post down below, but I'm actually going to read you a summary from Common Dreams because we don't have enough time to get through the full article of the Washington Post, even though I would highly recommend that you read that. Uh, but let's get to the summary. So this is from Kenny Stancil of Common Dreams, who reports, while the COVID-19 pandemic and corresponding economic crisis have made 2020 a devastating year for the vast majority of people throughout the United States, most of the country's biggest companies have prospered only to hand a large chunk of profits to shareholders while firing thousands of workers. An in-depth investigation published Wednesday by the Washington Post illuminates how big businesses are having a very different year from most of the country, which is suffering as a result of the federal government's negligent response to the ongoing public health catastrophe and inadequate provision of financial assistance to working class households. This is a global crisis, but the big companies are not treating it as one. They haven't skipped a beat, said William Lazonic, an emeritus economic professor at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. The Post shared examples of the surprisingly upbeat outlook shared by executives at some of America's largest corporations. I don't think we've ever been more excited or energized about our prospects, PayPal finance chief John Rainey said on a November conference call. These are times when the strong could get stronger, Nike chief John Donahoe told analysts in September. According to the newspaper's analysis, 45 of the 50 most highly valued U.S. companies have turned a profit in 2020. Despite their financial success, 27 of those firms 
cut staff this year, laying off more than 100,000 workers in the midst of an intertwined health and economic emergency. Instead of using the wealth produced by workers to keep employees on payroll, corporations put Americans out of work and used their profits to increase the wealth of shareholders the Post found. So I don't think that the average American, assuming they know that corporate greed is a thing, even knows that it's this bad. Like, I don't think that they realize that laying off employees as a means of raising shareholder value is what they do. And it's a common phenomenon. Like, it's not necessarily exclusive to this year. This is what they always do. But it's just particularly disgusting when we see people lining up for miles, waiting for hours to get a box of food on Thanksgiving. When we see 14 million households and 19 million individuals face eviction come January. Now, I do want to share a graphic that the Washington Post created because I think this is really, really interesting. So as you can see, there's two main categories here, companies that were not profitable, such as Disney and Boeing, and companies that were profitable like Comcast, Walmart, and Microsoft. And as you can see, even if they were still profitable, they laid off hundreds, if not thousands of employees in spite of said profitability. They don't care about their employees. They have one goal, and that is to boost profits. They have a fiduciary responsibility to increase shareholder value, and they will do that regardless of the cost. If that means throwing their own under the bus, throwing the very people whose labor they exploit, who make them rich, under the bus, they're going to do it. Because corporations are amoral. Their actions are absolutely unethical and immoral, but these are amoral actors. I mean, if this wasn't the case, Amazon wouldn't be working their employees so hard that they're forced to piss in bottles in order to be productive and meet the goals set out by, you know, management. It's not surprising. Like, none of this should surprise you if you've been paying attention. But that doesn't mean that because we're desensitized to these sorts of stories, we should lose our sense of outrage because... This is something that is a common phenomenon in dystopian late-stage capitalist societies. And, you know, this isn't just going to change because, you know, one day these large corporations have an epiphany and think maybe we should treat our workers better. You have to force them. It's sad, but again, not surprising in the slightest. Fox News propagandist Sean Hannity decided to weigh in on the Georgia runoffs taking place. And he, of course, went in on the two Democrats who are running, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. And these individuals, they're not progressives. They're pretty standard centrist Democrats. Both of them are capitalists. Both of them largely are neoliberals, especially John Ossoff. And there's nothing uniquely scary or socialist or radical about them. Having said that, though, that's not what Sean Hannity wants Fox News viewers to believe. And if you watch this segment, it's almost seemingly satirical. Like, if you told me that this was satire and you, like, swapped Sean Hannity with someone else, I would believe you. Because there's a really um, <laughs> strong common theme, and um, you're going to see it immediately. Every other word that he uses is radical to describe milquetoast centrist Democrats. Take a look. Two weeks away now, Georgia Senate runoffs that will determine control of the U.S. Senate and the new extreme Democrats are making it clear that if they win those races, they are ready, willing, and they are able, they will unleash what would be the most destructive, radical, left-wing political forces on you, the American people. All eyes on the great state of Georgia again tonight. These races are critical, critical to protect the country from a radicalism that would be unmatched in history critical to preserve the president's uh, work and legacy over the last four years, critical to continuing real investigations into real abuse of power, corruption, and that means zero experience Hunter and Joe and everything else. Georgia, if you care about radicals packing the, the Supreme Court, if you don't want open borders and amnesty, if you want energy independence, if you want lower taxes and less regulation, we're going to need you to engage in a major way and put aside whatever dif differences you may have with local, weak, rhino Republicans in your state. They're irrelevant at this point. Radicalism awaits this country in ways you cannot imagine, and only you, the great state of Georgia, can stop it. 
Now, yesterday, Joe Biden went to Atlanta to try and drum up support, as we showed you last night, for socialist John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, but barely anyone showed up beyond a few parked cars and the media mob. Yet we are supposed to believe that Biden is the single most popular Democrat of all time, more popular than, well, and more votes than Obama, more, 15 million more, 15 million more than Hillary. I had no idea Joe was so popular. Frankly, I don't really believe he is. So to the people of Georgia, I do understand and can totally relate to your disgust with your governor and your secretary of state for their refusal to take the needed action to restore election integrity and fix what are obvious flaws with the voting process. But that doesn't mean Republicans, conservatives, uh, freedom lovers, and patriots can stay home. Because this is a tight race, and conservatives and Republicans in Georgia need to show up, preserve the president's progress, stop the far left power grab. Right now, you are the single most important state by far in the union. Now, look, a new poll from the Trafalgar Group shows a slight lead, pretty much a dead even race with John Ossoff and David Perdue, a narrow lead for Kelly. Leffler, inside advantage, has Purdue and Leffler with a one-point lead each. It is that close. He's not even trying. Like, he's not even trying to be a persuasive propagandist. These radical Democrats, radical John Ossoff and radical Raphael Warnock are going to enact the most radical agenda that America has ever seen. Like, it, you're not even trying. Like, if you're going to do propaganda, at least put in a little effort, just a little bit more. He says, quote, they would unleash the most destructive, radical left-wing political forces on the American people. Okay, well, let's assume that what he's saying here, like the worst case scenario that he is trying to get you to envision comes to fruition. And we don't have the Democrats in control of the Senate. We actually have all squad type members in control of the Senate. What exactly could we uh, look forward to in this hypothetical situation? Medicare for all? Guaranteed healthcare, education, is that really something that's bad? If you ask people if they should be guaranteed healthcare, nine times out of ten, if you don't word that question in a biased way, they're going to say yes, because we're all human beings. Of course, we want what's best for ourselves. We want to be able to thrive in this country. So to do that, we need things. We need healthcare. We need education. We need a job with a livable wage. So is that really that radical? It's not. But really, to him, and the reason why we see so much pushback and fear-mongering about radicalism and socialism is because if you actually give people these types of policies that the radical left is pushing for, like Medicare for all, free education, they would love it. And if you try to take it away from them, they would hate it. So it's easier to stop these policies from um, getting enacted in the first place, because once they actually get enacted, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to take it away from them once people have it and they see that it's not so scary. I mean, look at Social Security. This was something that, of course, a lot of right wingers fear mongered about. But now that we have it, whenever there's talks of even cutting it slightly, people freak out because it's very popular. He also says, uh, these races are critical, critical to protect the country from a radicalism that would be unmatched in history. Really? A radicalism that would be unmatched in history. Let me remind you, we're talking about John Ossoff and Raphael Warnack. <laughs> <laughs> Do you support the Green New Deal? No. Do you support Medicare for all? No. Radical. He also called them both socialists. <laughs> To call John Ossoff a socialist, it's so delusional that if you're a political pundit to say this, I mean, you should you should quit because it proves that you are not qualified for your job. If you think that a centrist Democrat, center right Democrat, in fact, like John Ossoff is a socialist, then you don't know basic political terms. You should not be doing political commentary, Sean. But really, this this is all a ploy. Like, he knows that these aren't socialists. Even as dumb as Sean Hannity is, he knows what he's doing is trying to do damage control. Stop the damage that Trump caused. Because listen, Trump has convinced all of his followers that their votes did not count. So after selling them this lie that in Georgia the election was stolen from them, what incentive do they have to go out and vote for these Republicans if they don't think their votes are going to matter? And the way that Sean Hannity says this, like goes about convincing them, 
it's extremely patronizing. And if I were a Republican watching this and I were smart enough to realize what he was doing, I would think that he was trying to insult my intelligence because this is what he says. Uh, we're going to need you to engage in a major way and put aside whatever differences you have uh, or may have with local weak rhino Republicans in your state. He later added, I do understand and can totally relate to your disgust with your governor and secretary of state for their refusal to take needed action to restore election integrity. Again, I don't think he understands how contradictory this is. Not only is it patronizing, but he's saying... Listen, I know that you're so mad that Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, didn't steal this election for Donald Trump. But if you already believe that the election was stolen and Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger were complicit, why would you believe that this election in Georgia would be any different? Like, do you not understand? If somebody really did drink the Kool-Aid, then you're not going to convince them. But if someone didn't drink the Kool-Aid and they actually support Donald Trump and Sean Hannity, but realize that, you know, the election was legitimately lost, then they're going to think that this is condescending and think that you're being patronizing and, you know, you're uh, trying to pander to them and insulting their intelligence. Like, I don't know how this is supposed to work and galvanize the right to come out and support these two Republicans. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, they're going to lose. I don't know. It's a close race. But if you're trying to undo the damage that Trump caused, first of all, you need a better argument than socialism bad, these are radicals, because these are not radicals. And if you actually genuinely believe that they're radicals, you're truly showing your own colors. To think that John Ossoff is a radical, you'd have to be so far to the right that a centrist would seem radical to you. That speaks to your own radicalism, but radicalism in a bad way, being far right. But I mean, to get the people who believe this election was stolen and that the Georgia Republican governor was complicit to come out and support them. I mean, again, I, I just don't know how this would be persuasive. I don't know how this would be persuasive because if I genuinely think somebody took this election, uh, I'm not going to think, oh, well, this time it's going to be different. I'm going to be pissed. And even if I think it could be different, I'm going to want to teach the Republicans in this party a lesson in the state a lesson what sean hannity doesn't realize is that if people truly don't believe in the process then they're not going to participate this is the damage that trump caused and i know that sean hannity is doing what the republican party wants and advertisers on fox news who are also donors to the republican party wants but i mean it, it's kind of too late like once you delegitimize an election and there's a runoff taking place and you want people to participate in said election, it's really difficult to put the cat back in the back. It's going to take years to rebuild that trust. Uh, so this was interesting, but most like entertaining to me is just how he really wants you to think that centrist Democrats are radicals. Like, what a clown. I think that the Georgia runoff races are incredibly important because obviously I want Democrats to control the Senate. I want them to be in this position to where they feel pressure from the left to actually put up proof to folks that you represent them. Now is as good a time as ever. We're facing a global pandemic and you've got to be there for your constituents. Prove to voters that you actually care and that you're the party of the working class. And I just don't want Republicans to control the Senate, obviously, because they're crazy. But I mean, having said that, though, I'm not particularly excited about Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. I just see them as a means to an end. They're standing between two Republican extremists who have been caught doing insider trading. But as I learn more and more about Raphael Warnock through Kelly Loeffler's attack ads, I'm starting to like him. Like at first, I didn't like him um, at all because he doesn't support Medicare for all. And if you don't support a policy that would guarantee health care to people, especially during a pandemic, like, you're not worth a damn. Uh, but as I learn more about him through these attack ads, he is growing on me. And him not supporting Medicare for All, completely unforgivable. And if he is in power, of course, we have to pressure him to do the right thing. But I want you to watch these ads that Kelly Loeffler put out. I'm going to play two of them back to back for you because she attacks Raphael Warnock, but in turn, after watching these ads, I kid you not, I literally liked him more. I'm learning more about him, and he seems like he is the type of person that could be persuaded to do the right thing, because what is demonstrated in these ads is human empathy, which you often see lacking in DC. So I see this and I think, wow, not only do I agree with him, 
but maybe he could be convinced to support Medicare for all. Maybe he's lying about his real position on Medicare for all because he thinks that it's not politically feasible in a red state like Georgia or now blue state like Georgia. I don't know. Uh, but let me just remind you that I'm coming to these conclusions watching an attack ad that Kelly Loeffler put out on Raphael Warnack. And if you go to her YouTube page, she has like 600 subscribers, but the videos that she put out attacking him, specifically these ads, majority disliked. Because I don't think they're accomplishing what she wants them to accomplish. Uh, but I'll shut up and let you watch and see for yourself because these are great ads that really sell me on Raphael Warnock. I'm Kelly Leffler. I approve this message. Radical Raphael Warnock compared Israel to a racist country. We saw the government of Israel shoot down unarmed Palestinian sisters and brothers like birds of prey. Warnock sided with terrorists who hate America and would destroy Israel. They have a right to self-determination. Palestinian lives matter. I'm Kelly Leffler. I approve this message. Raphael Warnock attacks our military. Nobody can serve God and the military. Warnock said America's human rights record is worse than China's and Iran's. He compared our ally Israel to a racist country. And when Israel defended itself against Palestinian terrorists, what did Warnock say? Palestinian lives matter. Radical Raphael Warnock, dangerous for America. When I see that, I think, he sounds like a reasonable person. He sounds like a human being that actually cares about others, which is a rarity. And the arguments that she makes here are so bad. Like, I don't know why she thought this was compelling, and I'm sure it'll appeal to people in that right-wing echo chamber, but like to the average person, I don't know that this is going to be persuasive. The ad said, Radical Raphael Warnock compared Israel to a racist country. And then it cuts to a clip of him talking about how Israel was indiscriminately killing Palestinians. And after that, the ad ignores the substance that he said and just claims that he's siding with terrorists. They're nuts. He's saying that Israel is killing Palestinians. And that's bad. That's racist. But you call him the terrorist? This, on its face, is ridiculous. Also, um, it's controversial, apparently, because he said, quote, Palestinian lives matter. So do you think that Palestinian lives don't matter? Kelly Loeffler, are they some sort of, like, subhuman species in the world that we have to relegate to, like, third-class citizen status where it's acceptable that they are in the world's largest open-air prison? Like, what is your view on Palestinians? Like, she's kind of telling on herself here that she thinks that saying Palestinian lives matter is controversial, even if you are the most staunchest supporter of Israel. Do you honestly think that Palestinian lives don't matter? Is that, that the official position of people who support and worship Israel? Is that really the route you're going on? Interesting. Now, in the second ad, she says, Raphael Warnock attacks our military, and he said, nobody can serve God and the military. Um, look, growing up evangelical, this is not controversial. If you're actually a Christian, of course, God is above the military. What he's saying isn't controversial, but she's trying to, like, find some attack on the military and extract as much controversy as she possibly can out of this, and she ends up embarrassing herself. And she again knocks Warnock for claiming that Israel is racist. And I love this. Uh, it's controversial because Warnock said America's human rights record is worse than China and Iran. It's bad that he said this. Is he not right, though? I mean, I'm not saying that China or Iran has good human rights records. But are you suggesting that, like, we have a good one? There was a report that came out that showed... The United States government was intentionally droning civilians in Afghanistan so we could have more leverage while negotiating a peace deal with the Taliban. We bombed civilians on purpose so they'd come to the table in an effort to make us stop. Like you see, you know, Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps. You see, you know, Iran persecuting lesbians and gays. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of bad things taking place in these countries, but don't pretend as if America that our hands are clean. Like, that's that's preposterous. The blood is on our hands. We invaded a country and killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of civilians, and we're still there. We're droning civilians in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. 
So don't pretend as if America is something that it isn't. Uh, but these ads overall, seeing these ads literally convinced me that Warnock is better than I had initially thought. That is certainly something uh, because, you know, we know that these ads aren't intended to appeal to a broad audience. But the thing is that, like, if you want to win, you have to make an ad that isn't just tailored to people in that right wing echo chamber. You actually need to broaden the base. Otherwise, you're going to lose. So I get like trying to do this right wing framing and make a right wing argument because she's a far right winger. But this is like a really bad ad, even for her standards as a Republican who you expect to say that this is a radical socialist. Like this is this is not good. Like he's a pastor and you're kind of proving that he has human empathy here. So I, I don't know who this is going to appeal to that's outside of that right wing bubble. But um, this this literally made me like Raphael Warnock. And I'm assuming that if you watch this and you're a leftist, you like him more, too, after watching these attack ads on him. Up until this point, I was of the belief that Donald Trump doesn't actually believe the claims that he's making about voter fraud. He's saying it as part of a grift in order to raise money for his super PAC and pay down his campaign debt. He's saying this because he wants to rally the base ahead of the Georgia runoffs, although now that may be backfiring. I never actually believed that he believed his own delusions. However, a new report is actually saying that he did believe his delusions and he kind of convinced himself that he did in fact win. And on top of that, he seriously contemplated just refusing to leave come January 20th. Literally trespassing. This is absolutely bonkers, but let's uh, let's learn some more about this. This is from Peter Weber of Yahoo News, who explains President Trump was privately coming to terms with his loss to President-elect Joe Biden, but he has now reversed and dug in deeper, not only spreading misinformation about the election, but ingesting it himself, CNN reports, egged on by advisors like Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis, who are misleading Trump about the extent of voting irregularities and the prospects of a reversal. One advisor told CNN, he's been fed so much misinformation that I think he actually thinks this thing was stolen from him. Even the Electoral College formalizing Biden's win did not appear enough to shake Trump from his delusions of victory, CNN says, but it is adding urgency to a push by several of his advisors to gently steer Trump toward reality. Discussions of Trump's post-presidency future tend to go nowhere because Trump all but shuts down, CNN reports. In his moments of deepest denial, Trump has told some advisors that he will refuse to leave the White House on Inauguration Day only to be walked down from that ledge. The possibility has alarmed some aides, but few believe Trump will actually follow through. I am stunned by this. Like, it's it's shocking, but it shouldn't be shocking. But yet, it, it's still, honestly, like, I feel as if Trump is still managing to defy my expectations. So he actually has convinced himself that he won. And whenever they talk about his career, perhaps even 2024, he shuts down because he just won't accept that he lost. This is beyond pathetic. And you would think that his aides wouldn't have to do this. I mean, of course, they're going to work for him and try to convince him to do the right thing. But he has family members like his wife, Ivanka Trump, who actually he'd listen to. So where are they? Why aren't they talking him down from this ledge? Why aren't they trying to get him to grapple with reality? Like, I don't understand. Like, it almost seems cruel. And I don't care about Donald Trump. But if he was my family member, I would be trying to talk some sense into him because this this is insane this is bizarre now when it comes to him saying he refuses to leave on inauguration day because like it or not when the clock strikes 1201 he's out and if he doesn't leave he's trespassing so i just have to say this because i know that we're all thinking this and it's probably inappropriate for me to admit this but i want to say it <laughs> i want to see him refuse to leave and I want to see Secret Service, like, escort him out by force. I think that would be hilarious. I'm sorry. We all are thinking it. You're thinking it. I think that would be so hilariously entertaining. It it would be surreal to see. And I want to see it. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, like, if we're going to have a reality TV show 
uh, as a star as president, I want the entertainment value that comes with it, and I want it all. I, I want to see this. I, I want it to be a spectacle, because I couldn't care less about Joe Biden's inauguration. In fact, I think I'm probably going to avoid Twitter and the internet on that day because everyone will be insufferable, giving him way too much credit than he actually deserves. But if anything is going to make me tune in, it's the possibility of Donald Trump refusing to leave. I want to see it. I, w I want to see that dumpster fire. I think it would be hilarious. Um, but on the flip side, you know, that's... It's worrying. But after 1201, Biden is president now. The nuclear launch codes flip over to Joe Biden. Like, there's nothing that you can do. You're out of options. There's literally not a single thing you can do. So if you refuse to leave, you're trespassing. And I just think that, like, it's the perfect end to this era in American politics, assuming that this is actually the end of the Trump era and he doesn't become president again in 2024. But I think it would be just like the, the cherry on top of this shit Sunday that was the Trump era. And I think it would be funny. I'm sorry. Everyone thinks this. Nobody wants to admit this, but we all want to see it. We all want to see Donald Trump dragged out. We want to see him try to like barricade himself in the Oval Office by flipping over the desk and pushing against the fucking the door. I think it would be hilarious. Um, it won't amount to much, which is why I'm not worried. Like, if there was actually a feasible threat that he would try to, like, launch some sort of a coup by staying in the Oval Office and refusing to leave, then I would take it seriously and think it was a problem. But this would be just him refusing to leave and then subsequently getting escorted out by Secret Service. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't know if he'll ever come to terms with reality. But either way, this is genuinely sad. Like, if I actually cared about Donald Trump, if he was my family member, I would be so concerned. Like, if this was my uncle or father who was doing this, I would really, like, try to talk them down from this state of delusion that they're in because it's unhealthy. But it seems like Donald Trump's family, they're all so intimidated, they're afraid to confront Donald Trump. So he's going to continue to spiral and, um... Things like this are going to uh, leak out that he's possibly not going to leave office. That, yeah, that's that's entertaining, uh, to say the very least. In an interview with Jeremy Scahill, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said what I think we all really wanted to hear someone in Congress say. We wanted to hear her say that current Democratic Party leadership they're not good. They're bad. Um, and I think that, like, it's easy to criticize them. Like, we saw Rashida Tlaib and AOC condemn Nancy Pelosi before taking office, but once they were sworn in and you're working with this individual directly and you have that, you know, workplace dynamic and Nancy Pelosi is no longer a politician in your mind, but she's a colleague, you know, it gets a little bit awkward. Uh, but AOC said what I think is really important, like more people need to say this because if one person is brave enough in Congress to speak out, I hope this leads to a domino effect. But having said that, let's get to what she actually said. So Scott Wong of The Hill reports, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said she is not ready to be speaker, but lamented that the Democratic Party desperately needs new leadership and that Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Charles Schumer need to go. In an interview with The Intercept's podcast, the progressive hero and firebrand said the Democrats have failed to create a succession plan once Pelosi and her generation of longtime leaders, many of them now in their 80s, step aside. Pelosi has indicated that this upcoming two-year Year term will be her last as speaker. I do think that we need new leadership in the Democratic Party. The internal dynamics of the House has made it such that there's very little option for succession, said Ocasio-Cortez, who is 31. It's easy for someone to say, oh, well, you know, why don't you run? But the House is extraordinarily complex and I'm not ready. It can't be me. I know that I couldn't do that job. Even conservative members of the party who think Nancy Pelosi is far too liberal for them don't necessarily have viable alternatives, which is why why whenever there's a challenge, it kind of collapses, she continued. And that is, I think, the result of just many years of power being concentrated in leadership with lack of real grooming of a next generation of leadership. Asked directly if Pelosi and Schumer need to go, Ocasio-Cortez replied, I mean, I think so. But she again cautioned that the party has no succession plan or serious candidates who could fill that vacuum. The hesitancy that I have is that I want to make sure that if we're pointing people in a direction that we have 
travel plan, Ocasio-Cortez said. And my concern, and this I acknowledge as a failing as something that we need to sort out, is that there isn't a plan. How do we fill that vacuum? Because if you create that vacuum, there are so many nefarious forces at play to fill that vacuum with something even worse. And so the actual sad state of affairs is that there are folks more conservative that even they are willing to fill that void. Yeah, so I think that she's making a valid point. Um, Nancy Pelosi is terrible as speaker, but every time there's a challenge, it has failed. And the only like plausible person to replace Nancy Pelosi is someone measurably worse, Steny Hoyer or Hakeem Dre Jeffries, who would be virtually identical to Nancy Pelosi. And really, the goal was to have Barbara Lee be the speaker, or at least get in a position to become the speaker. And she ran for caucus chair, and she got leapfrogged by Hakeem Jeffries. So now we're in the situation where the next wave of leadership in the Democratic Party looks identical to the current leadership of the Democratic Party, when really, we should be looking at a turnover. Like, the leaders in the Democratic Party... They have to give up power, but they've been clinging to power for dear life, and it's in this situation where the party has become stagnant. Their ideas are old and antiquated, and new blood isn't able to take over. Like, there are obstacles to progress, and this is a real issue. And the thing about Nancy Pelosi is she has a lot of power because she controls the committee appointments, and on top of that, what's key here is fundraising. So Democrats don't want to speak out, and then she cuts them off, doesn't give them more money because she is, you know, a phenomenal fundraiser. That's why she's the speaker. So, you know, if you're going to take a shot at Nancy Pelosi, you can't miss. It's extremely frustrating because you think that a party who's serious about winning and setting up, you know, the party for future generations to take control of, they would be more welcoming to new voices like AOC. They would be trying to put in mechanisms that assist the future generations with taking control of the party. But, you know, if anything, we've seen the opposite. And it's not just, you know, a problem with House Democrats. We've seen, you know, a new generation of young people rally around Bernie Sanders. And sure, he's not young, but he's someone who has ideas that are new that young people identify with. And Obama stepped in. He came out of hiding, stepped in, and got everyone to drop out to back Joe Biden and we're back to square one, where we see the same people in control of the Democratic Party. And of course, who's Joe Biden filling up his administration with? Obama-era alum. And if you look to who the Obama-era alum was, it was Clinton-era alum. And this is another point that AOC made throughout this interview. And it's just, we keep seeing the same people shuffled around. And it's not working it's not working. We need new blood. But more importantly, we need new ideas. Ideas that are popular. It's honestly shameful that the party isn't on board with legalizing recreational marijuana. It's disgusting that during a pandemic, we can't get Medicare for all to even have a vote. So look, leadership is the problem. And I know that Nancy Pelosi rightfully takes a lot of the blame for this, but you also have to look to really powerful Democrats on committee positions. Richie Neal is one of them who single-handedly, you know, does a lot to obstruct progress when it comes to Medicare for All. So leadership has got to change, and until we have that turnover, it's going to be really difficult to accomplish anything, even if we get a progressive president. So what AOC is doing here is really important, like speaking out and condemning leadership, saying we need new leadership, that in and of itself is a really important first step to correcting the problem. Because before you can even solve a problem, you've got to admit that there's a problem in the first place. And I know that AOC knew this, but it's just really nice to hear her say this. And I hope that others will join her so she's not alone in condemning leadership. I want to bring some attention to a lesser discussed portion of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's interview with Jeremy Scahill. Because what she's saying here, I haven't heard many elected officials say this, but this point that she makes, it's a point that I've made, and it is incredibly important specifically for liberals. Because if they don't acknowledge what led to the rise of Donald Trump, then they're going to end up making the same mistakes again that will lead us to a Donald Trump 2.0. And what AOC says in this interview is key because she's warning them if we don't make significant changes, specifically if Joe Biden doesn't make some really needed changes, we're going to find ourselves in the same predicament in another four to eight years.
So, as Brett Wilkins of Common Dreams explains, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has a stern warning for President-elect Joe Biden about filling his cabinet with the types of war and Wall Street candidates that have come to characterize Democratic administrations over the past three decades. In an interview with the Intercept's Intercepted podcast aired on Wednesday, host Jeremy Scahill asked Ocasio-Cortez what she thought of Biden hiring members of former President Barack Obama's administration from corporations, including Goldman Sachs and McKinsey. It's horrible she replied. I think it's also part of a larger issue that we have right now, which is the Biden administration bringing back a lot of Obama appointees, which, depending on where you are in the party, may sound nice, I guess. But I think what a lot of people fail to remember is that we now have a Biden administration that's bringing back a lot of Obama appointees. But when Obama was making appointments, he was bringing back a lot of Clinton appointees, she added. Biden has tapped former Obama officials, including Avril Haines for Director of National Intelligence and Antony Blinken for Secretary of State, who played key roles in planning and executing militarist policies. Such picks and policies, admonished Ocasio-Cortez, are a huge reason why we got President Donald Trump in the first place. In addition to just the racism that was waiting to be reanimated in this country, there was just this extreme disdain for this moneyed political establishment that rules Washington, she said. So what she's saying here is crucial, because if Joe Biden and liberals and the Democratic Party establishment does not heed her warnings here, we're going to get stuck in the same situation with either Donald Trump again in four to eight years or someone who's worse than Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump, he may be a fascist, he may be a far-right extremist who has a cult following, but just individually speaking, he's not very effective as a political actor. Most of what he's been able to accomplish has been done because of folks like Mitch McConnell, Republicans who are pulling the levers of power for him, but alone... He's not that effective, but if you actually get someone in the executive branch who knows how to wield power, who's actually fascistic and really nefarious, that can be a really, really dangerous situation that we find ourselves in. The problem, however, is that as AOC makes this warning, I genuinely fear that Democrats don't care. And I say that because if you think through it, individually speaking, as just a lone Democrat in Congress, you're a centrist, you don't necessarily care about anything other than your career, think through, who is it more easier for you to have as president? Someone like Donald Trump, who is a divisive figure who you can easily fundraise off of, or a Democrat, where you kind of actually have to put in work and prove to your constituents that you're fighting when you have power. I fear that Democrats don't care or would prefer a figure like Donald Trump because he really is someone who the Democratic Party's base feels inclined to rally against. And having this common enemy kind of brings, you know, people together. But when you don't have this common enemy, then the attention is on the party who has power. And a a lot of Democrats don't want that. Like, they'd rather just be sitting there keeping the seat in Congress that they occupy warm and do fuck all for their constituents, because I think a lot of them are careerists and they don't actually care about policies. So, you know, what I want people to take away from this is that um, this warning is crucial, but it's not something that I think a lot of elected Democrats care about. But liberals, liberal voters in particular, need to acknowledge that they have to put pressure on Joe Biden. Don't just go back to brunch. Don't be complacent, because if he doesn't actually make substantial changes and improve the material conditions in this country, things are going to get bad. They're going to get worse. They're already bad, but they're going to continue to deteriorate. Because understand, the reason why we got Donald Trump is because people were so desperate. And when you reach a certain level of desperation, you become highly susceptible to radicalization. You'll believe anything. Any huckster or demagogue that comes along and tells you that they have the answer as to why you're experiencing all of these problems, why you're so poor, that resonates with people. You end up getting a predicament where we see this rise of extremism and white nationalism. And, you know, there's a reason why this isn't just happening in the United States. The United States, you know, our politics isn't occurring in a vacuum. We're seeing the rise of fascists in other countries, Brazil, India, even in the UK uh, and Canada as well. And if you don't actually meet the needs of people We're going to continue to deal with this. Now, I'm not saying that if we had like a socialist or even democratic socialist president and they did improve the lives of people materially in a concrete way, 
that all of a sudden this radicalism and white nationalism would go away and race, racism would be solved. That's not how it works. But what I'm saying is that these situations, the material conditions, they exacerbate existing problems. They can use existing issues like racism um, and white nationalism and use that as a means of them like getting more power and uh, consolidating power. So I really hope that folks listen to AOC. She's one of a few people who have made this point. And it's a really, really important point. You know, you hear a lot of leftists, such as myself and other podcast hosts, make this point. So you already know this point. But unfortunately, this isn't common knowledge. Like a lot of folks think that because Biden is president, everything is copacetic. Everything's going to be okay now. But that's not the way that it works. If Biden fails, we may be in a worse state than we're in right now. And that really is horrifying to think about. So I truly hope that he takes even the most slightest action you know cancel some student debt it should be all you know you know fully canceled but cancel some of it do things to improve people's lives otherwise nothing's gonna change we're saying merry christmas again Well, it's that time of the year again. That's right. It is the holiday season. Today is Christmas Eve. But for most individuals, we recognize this as the war on Christmas season because we all know that the radical left wants to destroy Christmas. Although, if you'll remember, last year, Republicans actually declared victory in the war on Christmas and Trump's family said it's over. We now don't have uh, the political correctness that we used to. I mean, people are actually saying Merry Christmas. You can say Merry Christmas again. Yes, Isn't that yes. so nice, Janine? I love it. I love Christmas trees. I love Santa over here. Thank you, President Trump, for letting us say Merry Christmas again. Things are different now. The war on Christmas is over. You know, we're getting near that beautiful Christmas season that people don't talk about anymore. They don't use the word Christmas because it's not politically correct. You go to department stores and they'll say Happy New Year and they'll say other things and it'll be red. They'll have it painted, but they don't say, well, guess what? We're saying Merry Christmas again. So there you have it. There is no more war on Christmas, according to Republicans, although the radical left this year has some new tricks up their sleeves. And being a member of the radical left, I know firsthand about what they are doing. They're plotting against Christmas, and this time they're trying to bring back the war on Christmas by using a global pandemic to cancel Christmas. Can you believe that? Republicans win the war on Christmas, and the radical left finds some new way to attack this sacred and holy holiday. It's despicable, but nonetheless, we do need to sound the alarms, and I want people to know about the left's war on Christmas. So, for more on this, we will go to the Humanist Report's war on Christmas correspondent, Fucker Carlson, I mean Tucker Carlson, who's going to explain to us specifically how the left is using COVID-19 to stop Christmas from taking place this year. Christmas is almost here, the best week on the American calendar, the happiest time that we have. This year, of all years, Christmas has a deeper resonance, maybe closer to its original meaning. In a time of crisis, you inevitably start thinking about those things you otherwise might ignore if you were busier and more content. Things like, what's the purpose of all of this? What matters most in my life? And what happens when it ends? In general, people tend to become more spiritual, more openly religious, when they're suffering. It's not an accident. In fact, it may be the upside. You get to think beyond the next Amazon delivery for a minute. Of course, not everyone is in favor of that. All of the focus on the big enduring things, the focus on our families, the focus on what's true and what's not true, the focus on eternity itself, all of that tends to diminish the power of the people in charge of our temporal world for obvious reasons. We take our leaders less seriously when we're reminded that they're just people slightly ludicrous, just like we are, when we're reminded that they too will pass, all of us will. If death is inevitable, and that may be the one thing you're not allowed to say in this country, but it's still true, then maybe we should pause before we destroy the living in the name of trying to eliminate it. Politicians understand this threat. They've figured out that Christmas is bigger than they are, and therefore it's a threat to them. Better cancel it. And in fact, they're trying hard. 
out of, of minimizing travel to the extent possible. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary, but to the extent possible, don't travel, don't congregate together. I know how difficult that is. Right now, that just should not be done. To the best of our capabilities, we should avoid travel and avoid congregate. Avoid congregate settings. So say what you will about Tony Fauci. He has mastered, after many decades, the weird euphemisms of Washington, D.C. What Fauci is saying here in English is that you need to avoid going to church. You need to avoid your own family. Those are the congregate settings he just mentioned. Listen to Joe Biden explain how many Americans will die if we don't cancel Christmas. We're likely to lose another 250 thousand people dead between now and January. You hear me? Because people aren't paying attention. You hear me? 250,000 Americans dead. You hear me? A quarter million people. That's a lot of people. In fact, it's more than the total number of combat deaths over the entire American Civil War, which, by the way, lasted four years, condensed into a single month. Imagine a Gettysburg every day of the week. You can't imagine that. It's too horrible. In the first 30 days, we would lose the equivalent of Reno. The next month, Scottsdale, then Lubbock, then Buffalo. Pretty soon, there would be nobody left in America. You hear me? Come on, man. Do what you're told. Cancel Christmas. So look, I've got to hand it to Zucker Carlson. As a member of the left, he does have us all figured out. I mean, by us telling people to be a little bit more safer this year, maybe don't travel because we don't want to contract a highly contagious deadly virus or give it to someone else. Actually, we don't really care about the virus. All we care about is canceling Christmas. He knows exactly what we're thinking. And really, you wouldn't be able to see through this insidious agenda unless you are big-brained like Tucker Carlson. Now, in that nearly 13-minute long segment, Tucker Carlson quotes numerous public officials that warns residents to minimize contact with others during this holiday season in an effort to slow the spread of the virus because hospitals are starting to reach full capacity in multiple states and it's getting scary. But he argues that any time they discourage you from trying to celebrate Christmas as you normally would, as if there wasn't a global pandemic, that's just more evidence that they actually want to cancel Christmas. It's the new way that the left is waging a war on Christmas, and he's the only one who sees it, guys. Now, the way that he proves that this really is about a war on Christmas and not the pandemic, he points out how public health experts say that Black Lives Matter riots are safe, and yes, I'm sure that they literally said that riots themselves are safe and that you should riot. <laughs> But celebrating Christmas isn't safe. So in other words, what he's saying is that public officials have different standards for different things. Christmas bad, riots good. And at face value, I understand how you could see this as a double standard, but in actuality, research shows that Black Lives Matter protests actually didn't contribute to a spike in COVID-19 cases, and perhaps this is because they didn't take place indoors. They took place outside and most people were wearing masks at these events. Whereas during the holiday season, I mean, it's cold outside. So you want to congregate indoors where it's a lot more difficult to do social distancing. But fear not, because as a member of the left who sees Tucker's argument, I understand that there's going to be a portion of the population that just doesn't take these warnings to heart and they're still going to celebrate Christmas as they normally would as if there was no pandemic. But I've come up with a compromise. Uh? A compromise that will allow us to save Christmas but still take the virus seriously. So what if the people who, no matter what, are gonna travel, gonna celebrate Christmas, what if they all wore masks? <laughs> Hang on, so you don't want to wear masks, but you also want to celebrate Christmas as you normally would as if there wasn't a global pandemic. Um, okay, so really what we need is, because I'm not the right messenger, what we need is someone like Tucker Carlson with a clear and decisive message about masks. So hopefully, he has a really clear message on this. Dissent used to be a defining feature of American life, but no more. Now we have mandatory consensus. Masks are good. Anyone who questions the utter goodness of masks is bad. What they're really telling you is that masks are magic. What appears to be a flimsy cotton face covering is in fact a holy amulet that protects us from disease more reliably than any modern medicine. Of course masks work. Everyone knows that. Dozens of research papers have proved it. In South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, the rest of Asia where coronavirus has been kept under control, masks were key. Great. 
So now we've got some issues. Now it seems as if Christmas actually is in serious trouble. Because if we refuse to cancel Christmas, but at the same time refuse to wear masks and follow the proper protocols to ensure that we don't spread this highly contagious deadly virus, then what do we do? If my compromise won't work, if Tucker Carlson won't tell his viewers to do the appropriate things that protect themselves, if they are in fact going to celebrate Christmas regardless, what do we do? It seems as if Christmas might actually be in trouble. After winning the war on Christmas, it's come roaring back and now Christmas is in more danger than ever. Last time on the War on Christmas on the Humanist Report. The Republican Party declared victory in the War on Christmas, waged by the radical left for decades. People are actually saying Merry Christmas. You can say Merry Christmas again. Yes, Isn't that yes. so nice? But all of a sudden, things were thrown into limbo when a global pandemic jeopardized all the progress that President Trump had made in stopping the War on Christmas from being waged. We're saying Merry Christmas again. And Christmas spirit in the country dropped drastically. Even the first lady started to lose her Christmas spirit. You know, who gives a f about Christmas stuff and decoration? Things don't look good. So we resume our War on Christmas special where we determine whether or not it is still possible to salvage this beautiful, holy holiday that the left hates so much. You know, yesterday we left on a pretty negative note where we learned that the war on Christmas that the left is waging this year might actually cancel Christmas permanently. Because, you know, back in 2019, Donald Trump and the Republican Party declared that the war on Christmas was over. But this year, well, the left has a new scheme that they're using to cancel Christmas. And for those of you who didn't see our video yesterday, I will let my friend over at Newsmax TV get you caught up on how the left is waging a war on Christmas this year. Okay, guys, they failed at canceling Thanksgiving. No way on earth they would try and cancel Christmas. Not now, no way. So uh, the next big holiday is obviously the Christmas New Year's holiday where people tend to travel, want to travel, want to be with family, but we just can't do it this year. The war on Christmas just got real people. It's time to fight for our frankincense. If that's not evidence that the left is waging a war on Christmas, then it must speak to the severity of the global pandemic that we're all dealing with. No, it speaks to the war on Christmas. Uh, so basically, he's speaking to what we talked about in a clip about Tucker Carlson, where in a 13 minute long segment, he provided us with numerous examples where the left is trying to cancel Christmas. And these examples in question are warnings about traveling during the holidays and celebrating indoors when we are all dealing with a global pandemic. It's not actually about COVID-19. It's all part of a leftist plot to cancel Christmas. It's their last hurrah as a way of stopping Christmas from taking place. It's not about COVID-19. This is what Tucker Carlson has found out. And as a result, since Tucker Carlson sounded the alarm and let conservatives know that the war on Christmas hasn't in fact been won, contrary to popular belief, well, conservatives around the country decided to rally around this one cause of saving Christmas. So Dennis Prager of PragerU posted a video of a photo of items in their store where they remind you once again that it is okay to say Merry Christmas. So the fact that we are here again where we have to remind people that you can say Merry Christmas, it really speaks to how much ground we've lost in this war on Christmas. And I say we as a leftist who is in fact waging this war on Christmas, but I can see where the conservatives are coming from because I also kind of love Christmas, but also being a radical leftist, I have to attack Christmas, so I'm conflicted here. But of course, you know, if we're going to attack Christmas, the right's going to fight back. Now, one thing that they did to fight back is actually declare Christmas Eve a federal holiday according to an executive order signed by President Donald Trump. And as Jim Jordan puts it, today's left can't cancel everything. Merry Christmas. Christmas one, radical leftists zero. <laughs> So make no mistake about it, that is unquestionably a huge blow to the left's war on Christmas. But as an ally, and also a leftist, I'm going to be a double agent here and let conservatives know that's not really enough. You need to do more because the left has gotten a lot more savvy about the ways that they wage war on Christmas. Because before they just say, don't say Merry Christmas. That's too politically correct. I mean, you'd hear them saying it all the time. We'd see people get arrested for saying Merry Christmas. <laughs> but now they're getting a lot more insidious in the ways 
that they undermine Christmas. So first of all, as Tucker Carlson explained, they're using the pandemic to try to cancel Christmas. But on top of that, they're harnessing the magic and miracles of the Christmas season to actually elevate their war on Christmas. Now, if you don't really know what I'm talking about and wonder if I'm being hyperbolic, I'm not being hyperbolic. We're literally talking about magic, as our friend from Newsmax will return to tell us about. Tis the season of giving, and swing states gave a lot to Joe Biden on this magical night. Stacks and stacks of ballots with Joe Biden's name on them were found under the election night Christmas tree in the morning. Keep in mind that all this happened in key swing states where President Trump had previously held massive leads earlier in the night. What? How is that legal? Actually, it isn't legal. A Christmas miracle, guys. Another miracle is the fact that Joe Biden won despite losing most historic bellwether counties. Trump won 18 of 19 counties that historically predict the winner of presidential elections. But don't you worry. Magic Joe pulled it all off. Guys, seriously, how do elections work? But what he's speaking to here is really important because he kind of has the left backed into a corner because on one hand, you know, they they hate Christmas, but yet they harnessed the power and magic of Christmas to steal the election away from Donald Trump and give it to Joe Biden. So isn't that kind of hypocritical? Hate Christmas, but yet use the magic of Christmas. Interesting. Interesting. Now, the radical left, who absolutely adores Joe Biden, they decided to steal this election away from Donald Trump, not because they care about politics, but really what this is all about is Christmas. I think I've cracked the code. If Joe Biden becomes the president, then the radical left gets what they want, and they get to permanently undo the progress we've made in saving Christmas. Everything that Donald Trump did to stop the war on Christmas can be undone like that by a president Marxist Joe Biden. So this can only mean one thing. If the radical left literally harnessed the magic of Christmas to steal this election away from Donald Trump and give it to Joe Biden, then of course, we know what their agenda is. When Joe Biden is sworn in, the first thing he's going to do is enact a constitutional amendment banning Christmas forever, which means that this is the last Christmas with Donald Trump as president. And as a result, since he's the one who saved Christmas, this is our last Christmas as well. Now, in the last War on Christmas video that we posted yesterday, I posed a very serious question. It was kind of a conundrum because we didn't know what to do. We wanted to save Christmas, but we didn't want to follow the proper protocols to make sure that we do it safely. If we refuse to cancel Christmas, but at the same time, refuse to wear masks and follow the proper protocols to ensure that we don't spread this highly contagious deadly virus, then what do we do? We now have an answer to that day old question. Maybe we can't save Christmas after all. As a leftist, I'm, I'm starting to see it. I now know why right wingers want to celebrate Christmas as if there wasn't a global pandemic and they don't want to do social distancing and they don't want to wear masks. It's because we all know this is the last Christmas. When Joe Biden is president, he's gonna end Christmas. And if there's no more Christmases, what's the point of living? So knowing this is the last Christmas, Christmas enthusiasts are going to celebrate as if there isn't a global pandemic. I mean, this isn't about killing grandma to own the libs like we all thought. Without Christmas, America dies. So knowing that this is the last time that we'll all be able to celebrate Christmas ever again, Rather than drinking the Kool-Aid, we'll all gather and we'll cough on each other and make sure that this really is the last Christmas and we go out with a bang and... Wait, that sounds really culty and kind of stupid, actually. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. Maybe it's the case that all of these warnings about traveling and, you know, practicing social distancing, maybe it's not some sort of nefarious plot by the radical left to cancel Christmas. Maybe it's the case that they genuinely care about your well-being and they want you to be here to be able to celebrate Christmases years to come and maybe Joe Biden doesn't actually want to ban Christmas and maybe Christmas magic isn't actually a thing. What if there's not a conspiracy to destroy Christmas and right-wing outlets just use this sensationalist clickbait story as ratings bait? Maybe we can have a normal Christmas next year when it might be more safe and everything might just be okay. Who's with me? Well, fuck it. At least I tried. Merry holiday, everyone.
Well, believe it or not, it is that time of the year again. It is time for the annual Hewness Report Award Show, where we select the biggest WTF moment of 2020. Now, it's odd saying, like, the biggest WTF moment of the year, because I feel like you can make the argument that 2020, in and of itself, was like one giant WTF moment. But there really were so many different events in 2020 that were shocking, they were gut-wrenching, appalling... And basically the way that it works is I will select four nominations and I'll put it up to a vote and viewers of The Humanist Report will ultimately decide what the biggest WTF moment was. So my first nomination, of course, is COVID-19, the global pandemic. Now, you can say that there were specific instances where this affected Americans the most. The moment where it officially became a pandemic was pretty significant and scary. Then when we reached certain milestones, like 100,000 deaths, 200,000 deaths, it's almost like COVID-19 was one singular thing that produced multiple WTF moments repeatedly throughout the year. So, I mean, this was a no-brainer. Of course, I nominated COVID-19 for a WTF moment of the year. Um, now, my second nomination is Bloody Monday and Super Tuesday. We thought that everything was copacetic. Everything was working well for the leftist movement in America. And then all of a sudden, things started to change. Inexplicably, Pete Buttigieg dropped out when he was performing pretty well. Amy Klobuchar dropped out. Beto O'Rourke endorsed Joe Biden. And that was Bloody Monday. Now, what followed on Super Tuesday was a bloodbath for the leftist movement. When we saw all of our hopes and dreams come crashing down... So, of course, I had to nominate Bloody Monday. Now, the next biggest WTF moment for me is Donald Trump's election fraud BS. Now, there's basically an infinite number of things that I could nominate Trump for when it comes to biggest WTF moment. But honestly, his election fraud shenanigans, it's just it's on a different level. And it's something that we've never seen from a sitting United States president. And I get it that it's Donald Trump and we're all kind of desensitized to his hijinks and shenanigans and bullshit. But this is different. Like when you are trying to delegitimize a democracy and steal an election away from the rightful winner, even if I don't like that winner, that's that's really uniquely WTF worthy. Now, of course, the next moment and final moment is the murder of George Floyd. You had a police officer kneel on the neck of an individual as he died, as he cried out for his mom and said, I can't breathe, you had individuals there filming this event, begging and pleading with that officer, and he wouldn't budge. It was just such a shocking moment. The lack of human empathy in Derek Chauvin's eyes, in the eyes of the other police officers that just sat idly by as one of their colleagues killed a man. It just, it was so uniquely shocking. And you can understand, like, going back, and watching this, like seeing the viral video again, like it really, it brought up those feelings that I felt the first time I saw it, where I felt rage and anger and pain. And you know exactly why this moment led to the Minneapolis uprising. So these are my nominations. But before we get to the results, of course, I have to name some honorable mentions. The Australia wildfires, the West Coast wildfires, the extradition hearing for Julian Assange, Trump's assassination of an Iranian military general, which almost started World War III at the beginning of the year. That seems so far away. We have the great MAGA meltdown of 2020, where Trump supporters were freaking out because they believed that the election was stolen from him. We have Amy Coney Barrett's rushed confirmation, the Portland abductions, Trump getting COVID himself and the circumstances surrounding that news cycle. We have Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, mass hysterectomies being performed at an ICE detention facility, and of course Donald Trump prematurely declaring victory on election night before winning. Those were all the honorable mentions, but let's get to the results. So when it comes to the Humanist Report's biggest WTF moment of the year, in fourth place is Donald Trump's voter fraud shenanigans with over 1,900 votes. In third place, we have George Floyd's murder, also with over 1,900 votes, which means that it came down to Bloody Monday and COVID-19. And honestly, this wasn't even close. With over 7,000 total votes, the Humanist Report audience believes that COVID-19 is the biggest WTF moment 
of 2020, which of course means that Bloody Monday is the runner-up, but comes in a distant second with just over 1,800 votes. And um, yeah, I agree with the results here. Um, I, I think that this really is something that we'll be dealing with forever, not just like the health ramifications, but the economic consequences of COVID-19. So I get why the audience chose this. I am 100% in agreement with them. Sometimes I'll disagree with what they choose, but this here, there's like no disagreement. How could you say that something that uh, that has affected the world in such a profound way isn't the biggest WTF moment of the year? Having said that, though, let's look at some specific results. So when it comes to our Twitter poll, COVID-19 is, in fact, the decisive winner with 44.6% of the vote. You have Bloody Monday and Super Tuesday coming in second with 28.6% of the vote. The murder of George Floyd coming in third with 17.8%. And Trump's voter fraud nonsense coming in fourth on Twitter with 9% of the vote. When it comes to our Patreon audience, the COVID-19 pandemic is the biggest WTF moment with 54% of the vote. Bloody Monday and Super Tuesday came in second with 25%. Trump's election fraud BS came in third with 12%. And the murder of George Floyd came in fourth with 10%. And finally, when it comes to our YouTube audience, again, COVID-19 is the biggest WTF moment with 57% of the vote. Trump's election fraud BS came in second with 16%. And the murder of George Floyd came in third with 15%. And finally, Bloody Monday and Super Tuesday came in fourth with 12%. Now, looking at the vote totals overall, this is really the only outcome where our Twitter, YouTube, and Patreon audiences are all in agreement. And overwhelmingly so. COVID-19 undeniably is the biggest WTF moment of 2020. Now, the only disagreement here is with the Patreon and Twitter audiences ranking Bloody Monday second, whereas the YouTube audience had this at a distant fourth place. But overall, everyone pretty much agrees that COVID-19 is the biggest WTF moment. But let's get to some comments. Count Dooku on YouTube says, not saying Bernie losing was the worst thing that happened in 2020, but it was the event that made me understand that 2020 was going to suck hard. Harry S. Plinkett on YouTube says, where's the all of the above option? Yeah, good point. BLS Soldier on Patreon says, 2020 was a WTF moment from George Floyd's death and others resulting in protests to the Australian wildfires to the Beirut explosions, but the pandemic and how some world leaders handled it takes the cake. 2020 really needs to chill out, seriously. And Jeff the Architect on Twitter says, everything. Yeah, beautifully put. So there you have it. COVID-19 is the biggest WTF moment of 2020. I absolutely, positively, wholeheartedly agree with that. Well, we've talked about the negatives, but now let's touch on the positives. Of course, you know, 2020 was a difficult year, but there were some moments that actually did inspire us, encourage us, and even give us hope. And I think that's important. So these are my nominees for the most badass moments of 2020. First, I am nominating Donald Trump's defeat. Even if I don't like Joe Biden, I absolutely loathe Donald Trump and everything that he did this year. His, you know, increasing authoritarianism, cracking down on protests, his election fraud lies trying to cripple the U.S. Postal Service, uh, him mishandling a pandemic, thus leading to hundreds of thousands of Americans dying. Him getting defeated really was a nice thing to see, even if it is bittersweet because his replacement is someone who... Is bad. <laughs> now, my second nomination is the Black Lives Matter uprising in Minneapolis following the murder of George Floyd, which catalyzed an international civil rights movement. What we saw in Minneapolis is the blueprint for social movements going forward. If you want a city to actually take action and listen to you, what they did in Minneapolis, you saw the pain, you saw the anger and emotions, but most importantly, you saw the effectiveness of their actions. They got everyone in the country and the world to pay attention to their cause, and it worked. So, of course, this moment was pretty badass. Now, also, even though this moment ultimately amounted to not much, Bernie Sanders' landslide victory in Nevada really was a moment of hope and inspiration. It made it feel like 
anything was possible. Like, we all kind of thought that Bernie had a good chance at winning in Nevada, but to win by that much and to see the reaction of the establishment and pundits on MSNBC, it felt really good. And again, he lost in the grand scheme of things. This led nowhere, but it was a moment, for me at least, that I look back at and I remember the feelings that I felt and I like I want that feeling again. I'm going to be constantly searching to get a victory like that so I could rekindle that feeling. And, and it was just such a meaningful day where everyone on the left was in solidarity. We were all cheering. And it's it's really, I think, a significant moment of the year. It was badass. So, of course, I had to nominate it. And my last nomination, of course, is the shocking victory of Cori Bush. She ran for Congress before in 2018 and she lost. And going into this primary against Lacey Clay, you know, it, it was going to be a really difficult battle, but she put in the work and she won and she won handily. And now we're going to have Cory Bush in Congress. Like, if that's not badass, nothing is if you're a left winger. Uh, so those are my nominees. But of course, there were some honorable mentions and this was really tough. So the failure of the coup in Bolivia and victory of the Socialist Party, I mean, this was really badass. I don't know how else to put it. This gave me hope. This gave credibility to the international socialist movement. This was great to see. We also have Katie Porter's takedown of a big pharma CEO as an honorable mention. In fact, you personally received half of a half a million dollars personally just by tripling the price of Revlimid. And of course, we have a citizen who delivered this scathing message to the LAPD following the Black Lives Matter protests. You are a disgrace. Suck my dick and choke on it. I yield my time. Fuck you. So this was really difficult for me to narrow it down to only four, but there can only be one winner. So the Humanist Report audience decided. And in fourth place, we have Cori Bush's win with nearly 1,300 votes as the most badass moment. In third place, we have Bernie's Nevada win with nearly 1,500 votes, which means for badass moment of the year, it came down to the Minneapolis Black Lives Matter uprising and Donald Trump's defeat. And the winner of the most badass moment of the year, according to the Humanist Reports audience, is Donald Trump's defeat with over 4,300 votes. This is officially the most badass moment of 2020, which means that the Minneapolis Black Lives Matter uprising is the runner up with over 4,200 votes votes. So this was really close. I mean, 100 votes separated the winner and the runner-up. In terms of where I stand, I don't know if I agree that Trump's defeat is like the biggest badass moment. If I really was forced to pick, I would probably choose the BLM uprising. But I could see why people would say that, because it is really nice to see someone who is just like this cartoonishly evil Bond villain lose. Uh, but this is why ultimately Trump's defeat won, because the audiences were really split uh, when it comes to our Twitter and Patreon audience and our YouTube audience. So on Twitter, the Minneapolis uprising is the decisive winner with 49.2%. And then we have Bernie Sanders' Nevada victory coming in a distant second with 18.9%. We have Cori Bush's victory narrowly coming in third with 18.5%. And actually on Twitter, Trump's defeat came in fourth with 13.4%, which, uh, I mean, it's obviously funny because this is the overall winner. Now, when it comes to Patreon, the Minneapolis uprising is the winner with 67%. Cory Bush's win came in second with 20%. Bernie's Nevada victory came in third with 9%. And again, Trump's defeat came in fourth place with 5% of the total votes. Now, when it comes to our YouTube audience, you can see why Trump's defeat ended up winning. Because our YouTube audience overwhelmingly tipped the scales in favor of Trump's defeat being the biggest badass moment, with 42% supporting that. But, I mean, not too far away is the BLM uprising with 35% in second place. Then we have Bernie's Nevada victory in a distant third at 12%, Cory Bush's win in fourth at 10%. And looking at all of the results overall, you can see that the audience was very clearly divided. You have people who voted on Patreon and Twitter overwhelmingly saying that the BLM uprising in Minneapolis is the most badass moment, whereas the YouTube audience was a little bit more torn with more overall leaning towards Trump's defeat. And it wasn't by much, but it was enough 
to put Trump's defeat over the edge, making it the most badass moment of the year. Now, getting to our comments, JB on YouTube says, beating Trump isn't badass when it's Biden winning. It's bittersweet. And I do see how that, uh, you know, how you could think that. AB on YouTube says, Trump was one guy, but BLM uprising was one generation. Hence, as much as I enjoyed Trump getting wrecked, I gotta go with BLM. Totally see that. Mark Sismo on YouTube says, The Nevada win was the best day ever. I was in Vegas on that day knocking doors. What an insane year. Yeah. Garrison Rucker on Patreon says, While there's no doubt that the BLM protests were powerful, let's not forget that one of the movement's leading activists, Cori Bush, beat a political dynasty and will be heading to Congress. Phenomenal point. That ACDC guy on Twitter says, I still think the most badass moment has to be Bolivia overthrowing the fascist coup. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, all good points. Uh, you know, when there's not much to be happy and thankful about in a year you know you're really looking for the best moments and what we got really were encouraging moments to see like trump's defeat undeniably is a good thing even if again joe biden sucks uh the blm movement i mean that's not going anywhere and seeing that uprising in minneapolis it really gave me hope that things are going to change in america like we're no longer going to be satisfied with the crumbs that politicians throw us we're going to demand more but i mean cory bush's victory Nevada, all really just big moments. So in a year overall, that was pretty difficult. You know, I'm going to cherish all of these moments. <laughs> they were all badass. But I mean, the most badass moment, of course, is Trump's defeat, according to the YouTube audience. <laughs> We are now getting to what is probably my favorite award in a year like 2020, our scumbag of the year. And let me tell you, narrowing it down to just four choices was almost impossible. There are so many people who deserve this title in a year like 2020 that I, I really struggled to just choose four. And when you see how many honorable mentions there are on this list, you will truly grasp how difficult this was for me. Um, so... I chose four somehow, and these are my nominations. The first nominee for Scumbag of the Year is Donald Trump. Now, I think that, to me, this was a no-brainer. He did so much damage in this year, uh, more so than other years, that he couldn't not be here. And this is actually who I think deserves the title overall. So, first... He fumbled when it comes to COVID-19, and as a result of his negligence, hundreds of thousands of Americans are dead. That's on Donald Trump. Additionally, he became more and more authoritarian this year, more so than other years. He sent militarized police to Portland to kidnap protesters. On top of that, he threatened to use the Insurrection Act. I mean, these are authoritarian things. He also used his postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, to cripple the U.S. Postal Service during a pandemic, knowing that millions of people would opt for mail-in voting because he thought that that would give him an edge in this election. And when he actually lost this election, he's refusing to concede. He tried to steal the election. And if he was successful, this would end democracy in the United States as we know it. And, you know, he's still lying. And he got enough people in this country to think that he's the rightful winner of this election. I mean, if that isn't scumbag worthy, then nothing is. So he's the one who I had to nominate, and I hope he wins. Now, of course, Mitch McConnell, that's my nomination. And so long as he is the Senate Majority Leader, it's easy to put him in this category because he does so much damage. He really is the lowest common denominator. Like when talks regarding stimulus and economic relief fails, nine times out of 10, Mitch McConnell is the culprit. He's the reason why it didn't get past. And when we need people to have relief, uh, when they're struggling, when they're going hungry, now is not the time to be playing politics. Because if you do, if you obstruct, if you don't let votes pass, you're playing politics with people's lives. And that's, that's a unique evil. So of course, Mitch McConnell is a nominee. And this might be a controversial choice, but I chose Matt Gates to be a nominee. Now, let me tell you specifically why this is the case. There's a lot of Republican politicians that are garbage, but he did something that I think is so beyond the pale that he deserves to be nominated. He literally called for American citizens to be hunted down like terrorists and murdered as if they were terrorists in the Middle East. I'm referring, of course, to his tweet uh, where he directly calls for Antifa 
to be targeted. And he said this, and then he doubled down. Now, Tom Cotton also called for this, but nobody was as direct and explicit as Matt Gates. And to have a sitting member of Congress call for the extrajudicial murders of American citizens, this, this is disgusting. And the fact that he didn't get that much scrutiny for this, the fact that this wasn't that controversial, really tells you how desensitized we are to how terrible our politicians are. So for that alone, he's a scumbag. So I nominated him. Now, this next one is going to uh, probably get me in hot water with <laughs> any remaining libs that watch, the, watch this channel. Uh, Barack Obama. Now, let me explain to you why he's a nominee. He killed not just one, but two major social movements. Had he not picked up the phone in March, we would very likely see a different president going into 2021. He single-handedly killed Bernie Sanders' movement by getting Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar to drop out. And then when he basically had Bernie Sanders on the ropes, he had a private conversation with Bernie Sanders and possibly encouraged Bernie to drop out as well. I mean, Obama coronated Joe Biden and... I mean, he's lucky that Joe Biden ended up winning, but still, you deprived us, single-handedly perhaps, of a president who actually cares about us. And on top of that, when the NBA was planning to strike over the Black Lives Matter movement, he got them to stop. A meeting with Obama got the NBA to back down. And on top of that, after he did all of this, he was uh, parading around the country as if you know, he were a hero promoting his shitty new book. Now, he's already a multimillionaire. He has a mansion. Why he thinks it's important for us to read, like, the 20th biography that he's writing about himself, it tells you how narcissistic he is. But, I mean, people need to realize that Obama is not your friend. He is your enemy, and he's the final boss of liberalism, and you have to fight him if you truly want change. Having said that, though, those are my four nominees, but let me tell you my honorable mentions. Derek Chauvin, for obvious reasons, Kyle Rittenhouse, Lindsey Graham, Amy Coney Barrett, William Barr, Elizabeth Warren, Mike Bloomberg, and Pete Buttigieg. But before we get to the results, let's look at the history of the Scumbag Award. So back in 2019, the winner of the Scumbag title was Mitch McConnell, and the runner-up was Donald Trump. Now, in 2018, Donald Trump was actually the Humanist Report scumbag of the year, and Paul Ryan was the runner-up specifically because he blocked a vote on ending Saudi Arabia's genocide in Yemen, or more specifically, us ending our support to Saudi Arabia as they carried out a genocide in Yemen. And in 2017, Ajit Pai was the scumbag after he repealed net neutrality, and Trump was the runner-up. And in 2016, hilariously enough, Hillary Clinton was the scumbag of the year because she lost what should have been a really easy race. Her hubris led to us getting Donald Trump as president, and I think that was scumbag worthy, and the audience agreed, and the runner-up was corporate media for assisting her ultimately in this loss. Now in 2015, Donald Trump was the scumbag of the year, and the runner-up was Debbie Wasserman Schultz, because at the time, she was doing everything in her power to sabotage Bernie Sanders when she was supposed to be a neutral arbiter. But having said that, the results are in, and you decided, the biggest scumbag of 2020. So in fourth place, we have Matt Gates with 150 votes. He made it by this time, but he will win this title in the future if he keeps you know, uh, going the way he's been going. Uh, in third place, we have Barack Obama with more than 2,100 votes. And that means that the scumbag of 2020 came between Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. But the Humanist Report has decided that the biggest scumbag of 2020 is once again, Mitch McConnell with more than 7,000 votes, which means that Donald Trump is the runner up with just under 4,000 votes, meaning that Mitch McConnell won decisively. Now, when it comes to our Twitter poll, Mitch McConnell is the winner still with 38%. Obama came in second with 34.2%. Trump came in third with 25.7%. And Matt Gates came in fourth with 2.2%. On Patreon, Barack Obama actually is the individual who won this poll with 59%. Mitch McConnell came in a distant second with 28%. Donald Trump came in third with 13%. And Matt Gates came in fourth 
with no votes. Now, when it comes to our YouTube audience, where most total votes were cast, Mitch McConnell came in first with 57%. Trump came in second with 28%. Obama came in third with 14%. Matt Gates came in fourth with 1%. And when you look at the results overall, you can see that the audience was actually somewhat divided. You have Patreon voters being the biggest renegades and choosing Obama as the biggest scumbag, which I respect and admire. But on Twitter and YouTube, voters were pretty much in agreement that Mitch McConnell was the biggest scumbag, although the YouTube audience was much more decisive there. Um, now getting to our comments, Stoned Gentleman on YouTube says, Trump's gonna Trump. Mitch McConnell is a genuinely evil and irredeemable turtle man. The difference between the two is McConnell is actually competent and therefore far more dangerous. I see that. My toes are cold on YouTube says, Rudy leaks fluid and farts Giuliani <laughs> would have been a contender for certain. Uh, Brian on YouTube says this is tough, but now that Trump is executing people to make himself feel tough while 3,000 people a day are dying, gotta go with Trump. Yep, totally agree. Jose Cadena on YouTube says Obama stopped us from having the most progressive president in modern history. Gun and Ballad on Patreon says Obama is the only reason Bernie isn't president right now. Bloody Monday is the only reason that thousands of more people are going to enter medical bankruptcy and our planet is going to be uninhabitable in a decade. Chaotic Human on Twitter says, not sure if I should vote for Trump or for Obama. Sure, I think Trump is by far the greater evil here, especially because of his mishandling of the corona pandemic, but I'm still angry at Obama for his interference in the primaries to stop Bernie. Yeah, and honestly, like you can make the argument that all of them are scumbags, but for me, I actually thought that Trump was the biggest scumbag overall, worse than Mitch McConnell, because even though I, I totally agree with the case that was made here, that McConnell is more competent, so therefore he's more evil, Trump was uniquely evil, uniquely competent in the sense that he really made moves to do long-term damage to the country, hence why I thought that it sh should have been Trump. Having said that, though, I only get to nominate. I don't get to decide. I can vote like everyone else, although I didn't vote in these polls. But um, yeah, there you have it. Our biggest scumbag for the second year in a row is Mitch McConnell. And even though I think Trump probably deserved it more, you can't say that Mitch McConnell didn't earn it. Well, it is now time for us to bestow our most prestigious award on one recipient. We will choose our MVP of 2020, the most important player in all of leftist and progressive politics for the entire year. Now, the way that it works is I choose four nominees and I put it up for a vote and ultimately the Humanist Report audience will decide. And uh, this year was really interesting because it's the first year wh where I expected Bernie Sanders to not win. Uh, but we'll get to the history of this award. But I, I want to tell you my nominations first. Of course, I nominated Bernie Sanders again. There was a time where I, I was wondering, should I actually nominate Bernie Sanders? Given that a lot of us, you know, we were disappointed that, you know, he, he quit. He bowed out of the Democratic Party primary too soon. It kind of felt like he gave up. But then again, there's the argument he was doing that because he didn't want people to risk their lives coming out and voting when he didn't feel like it would lead to him winning. It was tough, but ultimately I had to nominate Bernie Sanders at least and see what you guys think because Bernie Sanders is the father of the modern day progressive movement. Without Bernie Sanders, we wouldn't have an AOC. We wouldn't have a Cori Bush. He's the one that has basically awoken an entire generation, started this new politics of leftism and progressivism that we see today. So to not nominate him as a socialist, it would be almost like blasphemy. So I had to nominate him, although he's not my preferred pick this year. My second nominee is Cori Bush. She is the newcomer and she had a really huge uphill battle to climb in defeating Lacey Clay after losing once, but she overcame the odds. She put in the work and now we have arguably one of the best members of Congress ever elected, the most progressive, the most passionate, and I believe in her. So I think that that really makes her MVP worthy. Now also, Evo Morales. Evo Morales showed us how it's done. He was so popular that he is one of the few or maybe the first Latin American regime that we've seen in quite some time besides Venezuela that actually thwarted a coup attempt by the United States government. 
the coup was defeated because of his socialist party. He's telling us what we need to do. He gave us the blueprint. And even though, you know, our American audience might not be as familiar with him, Evo Morales is someone who you need to learn about because this is someone who's special. This is someone who is very significant and now more significant internationally, arguably, than even individuals like Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders because his party won. And we don't have much victories internationally when it comes to socialism. But he's paving a new path. Now, my final nominee. This one is, uh, it's, it's personal for a lot of us. My nominee for MVP, my final nominee is Michael Brooks. And it's really difficult to think through, uh, you know, the period where we all found out that we lost him. Because you, you really don't appreciate someone and the impact that they've had and so you're forced to reflect on the impact that they had, usually when they're gone. And losing Michael Brooks, it made us realize that he really touched us in ways that, you know, we hadn't thought about. Like for me, I think he was instrumental in my own political evolution. He is the reason why I don't consider myself a social democrat. Like I am a Marxist because of Michael Brooks. Like he has had such a profound impact on me and thousands of people around the country that it's going to take so long for us to recover from this. And of course, we had to honor him by making him the MVP. Now, I had some honorable mentions, and I want to get to those before we go over the history of this award. So my honorable mentions were Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I have my criticisms of her, but overall, I think she's still doing a lot to further the progressive movement, even if strategically, I do think we have to reevaluate what leftist members of Congress do to challenge leadership. Tara Reid is an honorable mention who spoke out when nobody wanted to hear what she had to say. Nobody wanted to hear the story that she told because she chose to tell it at a time that everyone viewed as inconvenient. But that took bravery that deserves recognition. Brianna Joy Gray for putting up with more abuse than perhaps anyone in the progressive movement. Nina Turner for keeping us engaged and fired up. And of course, Ilhan Omar for putting up with abuse as a member of Congress, facing death threats and attacks. I mean, still, she continues to fight for us. And it's really important that we have her in Congress and that needs to be recognized. But having said that, though, in the five year history of this award show, there has always just been one winner every single year. It's been Bernie Sanders, and I've rooted for Bernie Sanders some years. Other years, I didn't want him to win, uh, so let's get to it. So in 2019, Bernie Sanders won, the runner-up was AOC. In 2018, Bernie Sanders won, and the runner-up again was AOC. This year, I actually rooted for AOC because she was a newcomer, and you know I, I want some new blood to get recognition, and I was expecting Bernie to be the president. So, I mean, you know, I was expecting him to win in, in future years. So I was really rooting for AOC. Didn't happen. 2017, Bernie won. Jessica Rosenworcel, who was fighting for net neutrality, which was a huge subject that year, came in second. In 2016, Bernie Sanders won. Jill Stein came in second. And in 2015, Bernie Sanders won. And the runner-up was Malala Yousafzai. So the question is, will Bernie Sanders pull out a victory again? I personally hope not. I, I love Bernie, but I think that this year, Michael Brooks deserves to win. Uh, he's the MVP. Uh, but having said that, though, all I could do is nominate. You all ultimately get to decide. So let's waste no more time. Let's get to the results. So in fourth place is Evo Morales with 1,500 votes. And in third place, Cory Bush got 1,800 votes which means that the result is kind of what I expected. It comes down to Bernie Sanders and Michael Brooks for the Humanist Report's MVP award of 2020. And with more than 5,000 votes, the winner of the Humanist Report's MVP is once again, Bernie Sanders. Oh my gosh. And that means that Michael Brooks is the runner up with more than 4,000 
votes. Now, the audience here was torn. So when it comes to our Twitter poll, Michael Brooks is the decisive winner with 37%, which means Bernie Sanders came in second with 26.7%, Cory Bush in third with 19.8%, Evo Morales in fourth with 16.5%, and our Patreon audience crowned Cory Bush the winner with 32%. Michael Brooks came in second here with 29%, Bernie came in third with 26%, and Evo Morales came in fourth with 14 percent and finally when it comes to our youtube audience where the most total votes were cast bernie sanders came in first place decisively with 49 percent michael brooks came in second with 29 percent Corey bush came in third with 12 percent and evo morales in fourth with 10 percent now when you look at the overall results you can see that the audience definitely was divided, but since the YouTube audience who cast more votes overall overwhelmingly went for Bernie Sanders, you can see how they tipped the scales in Bernie Sanders' favor. But then you see Twitter preferring Michael Brooks, and on Patreon, they prefer Cory Bush. So the audience was divided, but it's nice to kind of see recognition be granted, you know, in different places. Like, Patreon gave Cory Bush recognition whereas Twitter gave Michael Brooks recognition, and I do appreciate that. Now getting to comments, Noah VH on YouTube says, I want to pick Michael Brooks, but I have a feeling he would pick Evo Morales. Totally agree with that. Uh, Michael Mancini on YouTube says, Bernie would win MVP of 2016 and 2019 for me, but certainly not 2020. It's got to be Michael Brooks for all the thousands of people he helped to awaken. Agree with that 100%. Mark Perez on YouTube says, Evo Morales definitely. His party ousting the right-wing U.S. installed party by election was a huge flex for the popularity of socialism. Sean McCollum says, Evo had the biggest win of any leftist in 2020, and by showing that you can trounce the neoliberal agenda, his victory is a lesson of determination and a moment of inspiration for every progressive movement across the world. Well said. Pepper Venge on YouTube says, they're all great, but I love Bernie Sanders. He's the father of the left-wing progressive movement in the United States. Totally see that. Mike Murdoch on Patreon says, all are perfect candidates, but I have to go with Cori Bush. She lost her last election only to come back stronger and knock out yet another political dynasty. She never gave up on trying to help the people in the St. Louis area. And now she's going to Congress after a hard-earned fight. Totally agree. Adam Zayas on Patreon says, Cori Bush, because back in 2017, she was the first political candidate I ever donated to. To see her win now makes me so happy. Keith Inholtz on Patreon says, I wish AOC was listed here. I am betting she becomes the next Bernie Sanders. Bill on Twitter says, Cori Bush, she got in against all odds and is already making herself known. Kid67 on Twitter says, I think Marianne Williamson deserves an honorable mention. It was just really cool to see her become more left-leaning as she learned about the issues. One of the few candidates who truly cares about all the people in the world. Yeah, I mean, all really um, convincing arguments here. But yeah, there you have it. You know, once again, Bernie Sanders is the MVP. And I can't deny that to him. I was rooting for Michael Brooks. But I think that, you know, Michael Brooks would have not wanted himself to win. I think he would have been pushing for someone else to win. Not that this award is that important or anything, but you, you get what I'm saying. Like, I respect that, you know, everyone chose Bernie Sanders. He really is the godfather of the modern progressive movement. And there will be a time where somebody else takes over. But for now, it, you know, Bernie Sanders is the best fighter that we got. And he still is leading the charge, you know, to get all of us another direct cash payment in, you know, negotiations. And by the time you see this, maybe he will have been successful. Either way, he's still fighting. He's still setting the agenda for the left. And we really have to respect him for that. But still, I think it should have been Michael Brooks this year. But I do see why you'd opt for, you know, Corey Bush, Evo Morales. These are all great comrades and i'm just glad that we were able to take some time to you know respect all of them in the way that they deserve So as many of you know, we ended 2019 on a very positive note with Bernie Sanders surging in the polls, having a phenomenal debate performance, and going into 2020, we are already seeing 
even more encouraging news with regard to Bernie Sanders' position in the polls. Iran has just claimed credit for an attack on a U.S. base in Iraq. This is, of course, a further escalation and retaliation to the assassination of Quds Force leader Qasem Soleimani. We are watching Australia burn. Uh, this footage here that you're seeing captures a fire tornado. I think you called me a liar on national TV. I think Bernie's lying. His whole shoulders come up like a little kid getting caught. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants to work with him. He got nothing done. Boom. <laughs> Iowa did not go the way that any of us expected. He's basically implying very heavily so that he won. Again, this was before any of us saw the results. And Rush Limbaugh kept doing this weird like, to Donald Trump. I just, I hate everything about this. We have a billionaire currently trying to buy his way into the White House. President Donald Trump has been acquitted. I don't have 40 billionaires, Pete, contributing to my campaign. He has overtaken Joe Biden's lead. As billionaire Mike Bloomberg floods networks with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of television advertisements, he is actually starting to see some results and he's surging. Bernie Sanders won New Hampshire. What they call a Sanders swarm, trolling Senator Elizabeth Warren as a snake, and in post after post, labeling Mayor Pete Buttigieg a rat. There were the executions in Central Park, and I might have been one of the ones getting executed. You know what, Mr. Bloomberg, it wasn't you who made all that money. Maybe your workers played some role in that as well. After that debate in Nevada, when I saw every single candidate on that stage, with the exception of Bernie Sanders, say, that they're open to superdelegates stealing the nomination away from the person with the most votes, it literally gave me this sick feeling in my stomach. Like, I felt physically nauseous from that. Bernie Sanders just won the Nevada caucus. And they are clearly, at least from eyeballing it, strongly in favor of Bernie Sanders. The happiest person right now is about 1.15 Moscow time. This thing is going very well for Vladimir Putin, I promise you. When it comes to South Carolina, Joe Biden won. We had Pete Buttigieg drop out on Sunday, Amy Klobuchar drop out on Monday. The establishment is quickly coalescing around Joe Biden because they want to stop Bernie Sanders. Uh, last night was a disaster. Let's start with uh, the states that Joe Biden did win. Alabama, Arkansas, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia. It's a lot of states. Elizabeth Warren came in third place in her own state of Massachusetts. Now it comes down to Bernie Sanders and Joseph Biden. You know, look, every time you take a loss, you have to think that this is, in fact, in reality, it's a much larger project. And I'm filling in for Mike today. And like Mike, I agree that it was a disappointing night for progressives and Bernie Sanders supporters. My father passed away on Tuesday, and the day that it happened, I actually, um, I took a look at the Super Tuesday results, because this happened on Super Tuesday, and I saw that we were getting, uh, demolished, and... I almost had a panic attack. Elizabeth Warren is not going to endorse Bernie Sanders. This really is a horrifying situation. We are looking at the prospect of a global pandemic. In all caps, he says, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. Three states voted, Florida, Arizona, and Illinois, and Joe Biden won all three handily. We are learning about an allegation from a woman named Tara Reid that is very serious. Why, Why are you still in the race? Democracy? Bernie Sanders has officially suspended his 2020 campaign. Your candidacy, oh. which I endorse. Now, the mainstream media is conspicuously talking about Tara Reid's Me Too story. Thousands of Americans are dying every single day because of COVID-19. Nancy Pelosi was interviewed and she sat in front of two $11,000 refrigerators a piece. Right, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or? We are about to pass 100,000 American deaths due to COVID-19. Great reviews on our handling of COVID-19. I'm gonna tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. As one of the officers had his knee on George Floyd's neck, he was crying out, I can't breathe. This was a murder. 
protests broke out across the United States. Do you mind oh, telling me whoa. why I'm under arrest, sir? Today, I have strongly recommended to every governor to deploy the National Guard in sufficient numbers that we dominate the streets. If a city or a state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. Now that we clearly see Antifa as terrorists, can we hunt them down like we do those in the Middle East? He's talking about United States citizens. No quarter for insurrectionists, anarchists, rioters, and looters, which means they should be extrajudicially murdered by the state. Barr, whose duty, let me remind you, is to uphold the constitutional rights of American citizens, ordered chemical weapons to be used against peaceful protesters so Donald Trump could grab a quick photo op. I have a message for Antifa terrorists. Defund the police. And I absolutely agree with this. An Ohio activist named Sarah Grossman died after being tear gassed at a George Floyd protest. Rayshard Brooks, he fell asleep in the drive through of a Wendy's and police officers confronted him. And then minutes later, he uh, was murdered, shot twice. Right now, I'm too nervous to take a meal from McDonald's. Wearing a mask is really important. I want to talk about the Tulsa rally because this was taking place at an indoor venue, probably, you know, featuring almost nobody wearing masks. It was Zoomers on TikTok and K-pop stands who actually trolled Donald Trump by ordering a ton of tickets. I work for Costco and I'm asking this member to put on a mask because that is our company policy. So either wear the mask or... And I'm not doing it because I woke up in a free country. Jamal Bowman won. The president of the United States retweeted a video of one of his supporters yelling, white power. When you compare us to other developed countries, they've been able to get COVID-19 under control. Donald Trump's approach to COVID-19 has been to functionally pretend like it's no longer a thing. Uh, his staffers have reportedly said that they just hope people grow numb to the deaths eventually. What is going on? We need to know Who are, are you? You have these people in an unmarked vehicle abducting people. I mean, this is literally what we see in authoritarian regimes. And even a small army of moms showed up to form a literal human shield around Black Lives Matter protesters to protect them from police brutality. It is with a heavy heart that I bring you news of the passing of Michael Brooks. You really see the impact that he had on the world. And it was, it was so large. I mean, this was someone who was such a kind soul. I mean, we didn't deserve him. Cori Bush just won her primary. She defeated Lacey Clay, whose family has been in office for 50 years. He tweeted out in all caps, open the schools. With some wet ass P word, P word is female genitalia. Bring a buck. <laughs> Joe Biden has announced his running mate and that individual, unsurprisingly, I think, <laughs> is Kamala Harris. Donald Trump's postmaster general is trying to sabotage the, you know, capacity of the US Postal Service. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, a man named Jacob Blake, they shot him in the back at close range seven times. Protests have been taking place in Kenosha, Wisconsin. A 17 year old named Kyle Rittenhouse, he murdered two people. The best is yet to come. America is at a crossroads. I'm sure there are Republicans and independents who couldn't imagine crossing over to support a Democrat. They fear Joe may turn sharp left and leave them behind. I don't believe that. Herman Cain died from COVID-19. A whistleblower from an ICE detention center in Georgia is sounding the alarm about a practice that should absolutely shake everyone to their cores. Uh, it's also more deadly than your you know, you're even your strenuous flus. He's the one 
who stopped the Postal Service from distributing five masks to each family. He's the one who lied to us about the severity of COVID-19. The entire West Coast is on fire and it's extremely horrifying. The air is hazardous where I am currently. The extradition hearing for Julian Assange is finally taking place. On Friday, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away at the age of 87. He's not paying his fair share of taxes. In fact, you're paying more than Donald Trump. By the way, maybe you could inject some bleach in your arm and that would take care of it. This is the that same man. That was said sarcastically, that was you seen, know that. That was a shit show. He's downplaying it as he leaves the hospital after contracting COVID-19. Bless our president. I will die for him. I will die for that man happily. Great insult. If I'm confirmed, you would not be getting Justice Scalia. You would be getting Justice Barrett. Oh, well, thank God. I feel so much better. We sent in the U.S. Marshals. Took 15 minutes. It was over. The United States government assassinated a U.S. citizen. He bragged about this at a rally. The coup attempt in Bolivia by the United States government has officially failed. What does Lindsey Graham do? He goes and hugs 87-year-old Dianne Feinstein. She's not very bright. In a 52 to 48 vote, the United States Senate has voted to confirm far-right extremist Amy Coney Barrett going to bed. We kind of thought, all right, you know, since Biden is underperforming the polls in other places, it isn't illogical to think that maybe the red mirage isn't in fact a mirage. Trump capitalized on that opportunity to prematurely declare victory. We were getting ready to win this election Frankly, we did win this election. Biden is in the lead. The Biden crime family steals this election. Joe Biden will become the next president of the United States, and Donald Trump has in fact been defeated. House Democrats underperformed. They will retain control of the House, luckily, but they still lost ground. And when it comes to Senate Democrats, we still don't even know. We are now seeing upwards of 100,000 new COVID-19 cases per day, and it is the worst it's ever been. Vaccine trials are showing very promising results. This is real. It is not made up. Will Barr, he is now even saying there's no evidence of voter fraud. We have 100,000 people in America in hospitals. We saw nearly 3,000 deaths in a single day, all while the president does absolutely nothing to contain the virus. He's still complaining about the election that took place last month. Well, that is everything I am done talking. If you managed to make it this far in the program, Thank you so much. Uh, before we close this episode, uh, I want to thank all of the people who make this show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. Truly, when I say that you all are phenomenal, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Like, you help the show not just to survive, but thrive, and it means the world to me. Thank you all. So, I uh, will see you all next year. Um, I really hope that you take time for self-care. Uh, this has been a really, really emotionally draining year for all of us and even if it's something as simple as watching a movie or playing video games i hope that you find the time to recuperate from everything that we we dealt with and hopefully you could take time off of work or just take an hour to just like treat yourself to something like we all we have to prepare ourselves to keep fighting and if you take some time to just like relax and like focus on yourself i think that there really is immense value in doing that so i would encourage you to if you, if you have the luxury of doing that uh that's it uh, i'm out i'll see you all next year folks uh my name is mike figueredo this has been the humanist report take care everyone i will see you in 2021